Good evening. I call to order on Wednesday, the 23rd of January, 2019, meeting of the Water Company Acquisition Study Committee. This evening, we will review and approve minutes from the committee's three previous meetings this month, address the committee's review and discussion of engineering relating to potential town acquisition and ownership of the water system, and finally, the committee will discuss and vote a recommendation as charged by the Board of Selectmen at its 11 December 2018 meeting. So first, I would ask members to review the draft minutes of our meetings on 10 January, 15 January, and 16 January in your packets, and offer changes or a motion to accept all three drafts as written. And Josh, uh, whenever you need to get more comfortable given your uh, hip replacement surgery last Thursday, please feel free to I, do I so. I should be offended if I stand up. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not you know, outraged by anything that you're saying. I'm just going to be up and down <laughs> over the course of this meeting. Now, this is his second hip replacement surgery in uh, less than six weeks? Well, six weeks and then last Thursday. Yeah. Now, so it may take a minute for you all to review the three drafts. Do you want to do them one at a time or all three? Okay, we want to be. I don't think Joe's okay. quite ready. Why don't we start with the draft for the meeting on January 10th? Any changes? Yes. I was not there on the 10th. Okay. So I'm upset. Motion to accept the meeting. Motion to accept the. Motion to accept the minutes of the meeting of the Water Company Acquisition Study Committee held on January 10th, 2019. Second. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Shall you abstain? And one abstention. The minutes for the draft for January 15th. Any Sorry. suggested changes? Make a motion. I have a motion to accept. Do I have a second? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Accepted as written. And finally, the draft of the minutes for the meeting on January 16th. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. I have a motion January to accept. 16th. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. And one abstention. Okay. Okay. I will now ask committee member Bob Higgins to lead the discussion about engineering. After Bob has completed his presentation, I will first ask committee members if they have questions or comments, and then I will open the floor to the public. Bob, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Higgins. Uh, I've been a member of the Water, Water Company Acquisition Study Committee since my appointment in 2015. And I currently sit on the uh, town's elected sewer commission. I'm also a member of the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority Advisory Committee. Okay, I'm a phase leader for the engineering phase of our committee's investigations, probably because I had worked for the water company for more than 25 years when it was Mass American. 
During that time, I was, well, I was responsible for the entire distribution system, all the mains, valves, pumping stations, services, etc., that distributed treated water to households and businesses in Hingham Hall and North Cohasset. I was also responsible for construction projects within our division, with our division engineering group. Okay. Uh, go to slide number two, John, please. Okay, first thing I want to talk about this evening is the, uh, on slide two here, is the capital investment and the operations and maintenance. I'm sure you're all well aware that uh, uh, we have to spend uh, money uh, frequently to replace pipelines and service lines and buy new water meters and upgrade the pumping stations and the treatment plant. And those are all the capital things. Uh, you know, I won't get into the weeds too much, but it, it's very capital intensive. Uh, and it's very important that we continue a very uh, high investment in our, in our infrastructure, OK? I'm going to talk about two aspects of the water system engineering, capital inf uh, inf investment system, including the pipeline construction projects the daily operations and maintenance of the water system. Okay. Next, John. Okay, this is just a slide showing the, uh, the general layout of the water system uh, that is currently being served by Aquarian Water Company in Hingham Hull in North Cohasset. Uh, as people know, the water system is comprised of uh, of water supply source, okay, source of supply, an acorn pond, and 12 wells. And uh, also, um, we have uh, 192 miles of water mains of various sizes which distribute the water to homeowners and businesses in Hingham, Hull, and North Cohasset, also supplying uh, fire protection through fire hydrants and sprinkle systems, uh, fire sprinkle systems in these commercial and uh, large buildings. Okay, the, and uh, no, no, the average of those water mains is about 40, uh, yeah, the next one, page three, is about 64 years old. And the, excuse me, the water mains are typically expected to last about 70 years. Bottom line, we have a water system that's almost 140 years old. By, by Aquarian's own testimony to the Department of Public Works this past summer, almost one-third of the water, water mains have been in service longer than 70 years expected life. Almost one-fifth of those mains have exceeded 100 years old. Okay. Let's look at capital investment and pipeline construction in more detail. We'll go to four, John, please. Okay. Okay, the approach I took... Okay, to review Aquarian's capital improvements plans, DEP and DPU filings in the last rate case, I think it's 17.90 uh, or 17-90, exhibits and town information. Aquarian has consistently failed to make necessary capital investments in our aging water system, particularly in water mains. I'll show you some slides on that on uh, page five in a minute. The break and fix, uh, proactive approach to the water mains. Aquarian is not significantly coordinating with the town's road building plan and resurfacing plan. Okay, it, it, it actually compromises the quality of the newly paved roads, requires Hingham taxpayers and multiple times to pay roads. Uh, repairs can be uh, sometimes, uh, you may have to do it more than once. As part of the work addressing water system engineering, I reviewed Aquarian's latest publicly available capital study plans, Aquarian's filings with the Department of Public Utilities, environmental protection regulations, Aquarian's latest rate case testimony and exhibits, and town information concerning its building roads program. I've reached two conclusions from the analysis. Aquarian's capital plans and studies have provided a clear roadmap over the past 11 years for what needs to be done. Aquarian just hasn't spent the money to implement these capital plans. This is particularly true as it relates to water main replacement and rehabilitation, resulting in reactive break and fix approach opposed to a proactive one that systematically addresses problems before they become emergencies. 
Okay. Following is the Aquarian's presentation on the water main replacement history. And I hope you can see this. Uh, it's not bad. Okay. Uh, this, there's almost uh, a million feet of pipe in the aquarium water system, okay? Various sizes and stuff. And in their own recommendations, uh, they recommended uh, in the uh, 2014 commission study of a time run uh, to replace 1% of the system's main feet replacement each year, which is fairly reasonable. Okay, aquarium track records are less than one third of one percent. And I'd like to call to your attention uh, when you start when we start the chart back here, it was 2005, going up to 2016. In the year 2016, there's almost 8,000 feet of pipe. The following year, they filed an array case. Okay, and then again after that was completed, started to slide down again. As Aquarian's own data shows over the past 13 years, it has replaced less than one third of what he, its own capital study directed for aging water mains and are near, the, are near or past the end of their expected useful life. As its current pace, Aquarian's own testimony to the Department of Public Utilities, main breaks are going to increase dramatically over time as large portions of the mains inventory exceeds the reasonable useful life, resulting in need to spend significantly more money addressing leaks and breaks. Okay. Those water mains have two big impacts. One is for the homeowner and the business safety risks due to, due to lack of fire procession. You know, you lose hydrants and you lose your fire service to your properties. Uh, we have a lot of fire services in Hingham, large buildings that require sprinkler systems. So. If it's in that area, you lose that. The increased cost for both the taxpayers and the ratepayers to repave roads after emergency street opening pits to repair failed mains. Let's look at the history of the street openings, okay, of the emergency water repairs. Just in Hingham, of the streets that had been repaved uh, were under the town's five-year moratorium for reopening. Next. Okay, you got that one, John. Okay, the chart in uh, the chart in it basically shows the number of roads uh, that were paved from 2011 to even 2018. Okay, and it also shows that in that five-year window, okay, the town replaced. For instance, the first one was 17. The next one was 17, 13, 13. On top of that, there in the red are the main breaks on those roads that have been repaved within that five-year window. Water mains, water services, okay. Since 2011, 22% of the streets had been repaved in accordance with the, with the town engineer's public plan and were reopened sooner than the five-year moratorium due to the emergency water main breaks. Some of those could have been service leaks, some could have been main leaks. So more than one-fifth of the repaved streets had to be reopened and repaired at both taxpayers and repair expense, when better coordination by Aquarian with the town would have prevented that additional expense by replacing aging mains with those streets that had been opened for repaving. Hull has just implemented a similar, pro a similar road building program so now the need for close coordination by the water system owner is even greater. Okay, the next two slides show more detail regarding the consequences of the lack of coordination in road building programs. Next, John, please. Okay, the lack of coordination with the Hingham Road Building Program. Of the 113 roads resurfaced or rebuilt between 2012 and 2017, they contain water mains that were prioritized for replacement by Aquarian's Commission capital studies. The mains were not replaced, and Howe Street, which the town has paved, has already had a break on it, and that was required an emergency street opening permit. Um, I know it seems like a lot, but 
uh, town of Hingham spends a great deal of hard-earned money, okay, to repave roads and upgrade them and bring them up to a standard. Uh, I, th I think it's very important that uh, that we pay more attention to to what uh, is going on there. It's your money, my money. Okay, the lack of coordination in a big program. Those 113 roads were reconstructed or rebuilt between 2012 and 2017. Water mains were replaced in all of some of eight of them for a total of 7%. Okay, hold on. Another consequence of not keeping the water mains in good, re good repair, um, especially the older ones, they could be leaking and that contributes to the unaccounted for water when you don't have uh, a handle on it. Let's look at Aquarian's uh, history with respect. Okay, result of the water main under investment leaks. This chart shows here that uh, from 2010 to 2017, okay, in the service era, this is the unaccounted for water from 2010 to 2017. And as you can see, it started out at 15, and then it, you know, it climbed up, and it climbed up and up, but then it started to climb down again and again. And then they reported to the DEP, I think it was 17% uh, or 17%. But in their DPU filing, of metered consumption, they only reported 77% of that water. 77%, so there's a little discrepancy between what they reported to the Department of Public Utilities and what they reported to the, D to the DEP. I hope they can explain that to us. Okay. Next slide. Just Okay, now the next slide. Okay, next slide is uh, <coughs> slide 10. All right? Yep. Okay. Capital investment recommendations. Okay. Funding to begin to implement recommendations for existing capital plans. Um, remembering that capital is not only pipeline, but it's also uh, should be for water service replacements for older water services to the newer water service that are, have aged out and a steady program every year of 40 or 50 replacements and eventually you're gonna get to a point where you'll be doing 10 and stuff like that, okay? <clears throat> and I think it's important to know too that there's uh, water meters involved in the capital and capital is also, again, I'll say, for the treatment plant, the pumping stations. There's a lot of demand for capital in any, any system, any utility, okay? Let's see. Okay, the uh, Anderson, the Anderson Tech uh, excerpt. If the town votes to acquire the water system, I recommend that a maximum funding capital at the levels presented on July, January 10th by the Anderson Tax Expert. Okay, the existing capital studies and plans provided a good year one starting point. However, I'd recommend updating those plans with a capital asset management study during the first year of the town ownership. The Ty and Braun document is a living document, and it's meant, and it's a study, and it's meant to be changed from time to time. It's meant to be utilized. It's a budgeting tool. It's a planning tool, and it's a good tool because we know we have so many miles of pipe that need to be replaced and small water mains and large water mains and so forth and so on. But that's a good starting point, but we need to continue to update that <laughs> and uh, it's a great tool. With the proposed capital funding, the town would be able to transform from a break and fix approach to proactive one that reduces emergency situations and their attendant costs to taxpayers and ratepayers. Were the town to acquire the water system, it would then become eligible for federal and state low interest loans and or grants which are currently unavailable to the corporate owners of Aquarian. They have to go out and finance everything on their own 
without any subsidies. And uh, there are several programs out there right now uh, that we have to compete. We would have to compete with for, for money in the federal government, in the state government, and uh, there's a couple of different avenues in the state where we could apply for. We'd have to compete for the monies, though, and uh, and I think we probably could have a pretty good chance of getting some of that. Okay, the federal and state interest loans and grants are now actually currently unavailable to the, to the uh, corporate owners. Now let me switch gears and briefly address the second important component of engineering, the daily operation and maintenance of the water system. Okay. Basi basically, uh, the daily operations and maintenance approach. Okay. I met with other communities and representatives from Mass and DEP to understand requirements. And um, it's pretty much standard with all the people that I dis had a discussion with and the people I spoke to. I uh, have a very large network of friends in the water industry today. And they're all, they're all in the same boat. You know, they have to do flushing and they have to do maintenance of services and boxes. And, you know, they have to do flushing and they have to do, you know, cross-connection inspection work and follow the rules of the DEP. So there's a lot to it. And uh, I have I actually had a great time talking to a lot of people who have the same issues. It was really great. Okay, uh, I held an incident of conversations with experienced water system operators and obtained uh, non-binding cost estimates. I took the study, okay, that uh, Ty and Bond did, and I used those numbers to project numbers that Aquarian would have to <coughs> include in their rates. Okay, you and Tata and Howard. yeah, Tetar and Howard. I'm sorry, Tetar and Howard. Uh, they're pretty. They're pretty good numbers, and uh, it tells a story. Okay, and my conclusion, and then uh, reviewed the uh, considered options. The conclusions that I came to: Aquarian has inconsistently managed operations, perhaps due to revenue pressure or shareholder financial obligations. Okay, main breaks, data collection. Uh, water main flushing program and so on and so forth. Regardless of the ownership of all mass water systems must completely be, must, be, must comply with the DEP requirements, many of which relate to the daily operations and maintenance. Some of its policies own water systems, manage daily operations, while others are outsource their experienced water system operations. Okay, during, during our work on engineering phase, we have met and spoken with the individuals and so forth and so on, okay? And I've looked at the Tater and Howard study. As feedback that we received uh, validates the daily offerings made can be and should be significantly improved through the consistent implementation of best practices and now in place. By Aquarian's own testimony this past summer, it has, re it has a revenue deficiency of over $2 million a revenue deficiency of $2 million. Whatever the reason, revenue pressures or shareholders' obligations, the system is not operated and maintained as well as it should be. It may seem obvious, but best practices begin with collecting and retaining sufficient data to understand performance to date. Next slide, please. Engineering. Aquarium, <coughs> I'm sorry, inadequate appearance system data collection. From the 2016 Aquarium Commissioned Asset Management Study, KINU, it's called, or KIU, the type of analytical approach adopted for the CT system in order to generate the necessary input values was not an option for the mass system because of inquiring data. So, the important thing in a utility business, in my opinion, is, is you, you have to have uh, ways of collecting data that you use to get an overview of how your system is performing and how to budget for the operations. And it will highlight some of the areas that maybe we've either underfunded or overfunded, but it's a great tool to use to tell us how we're doing, okay?
Okay. Uh, this, yeah. Okay. This slide really speaks for itself. Given the Quarian's ownership over the 16 over the 16 years, it's hard to believe that such critical data, such as related to water main breaks and their timing, has not been tracked. In sufficient detail in order to name to the third party study. I just wanted to repeat that because I myself, I used to be a bear on, on data collection and it was really helpful to me. It's particularly noteworthy that the geographic information system, the GSI data regarding main breaks was available for two other systems, Oxford and Millbury in Aquarians, Massachusetts operation but not for our water system, the largest of Aquarian's three systems. To me, that's an indictment of the fashion for which Aquarian has managed daily operations. Um, I'll let that go with that. Another, another facet of well-managed operations is rigorous program of annual flushing of the entire distribution system. The penalty for not performing system-wide flushing each and every year is among other things, discolored water, and let's look at the track record on that. <clears throat> and just to be honest with you, uh, I had an engineered plan to flush this system. And uh, only if we had the water to do it, number one, OK? And if we didn't, we had to go with a very large capacity uh, program of public relations to explain to people that the water just was not available. And that, that's something we can talk about if you want sometime. OK, Quarian addressed this discolored water in parts of Hingham and Hull. And you can't see a lot of the stuff there. OK, so it's difficult to see. But I guess there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, in, in 16, there was a lot of discolored water around. And uh, I guess it might have been during a flushing period or a main break or something like that. But guys, they've had six. They've been they've been working at this since uh, they bought the company, and that's over 16 years ago. Do they really have a plan? Do they really implement it? Inconsistent operations and discolored water. Okay, one year later, Aquarian had flushed the southern part of the distribution system and expressed plans to flush the remaining portions in the summer of. Fall of 2017. Don't forget, in the last four or five years, ladies and gentlemen, we've been in a semi-drought and a drought condition. And the water may not always be available when we need it because we need velocity to scour the pipes to do the flushing. And that sometimes is just not available. But you need to tell people that we're not going to be able to do it, or we're going to have to uh, do a small portion, or we're not going to do it at all. You have to, you have to tell people about it. You have to do a job. You have to sit, uh, notify the town managers and uh, selectmen and so forth, and, and let us know what's going on. Just let us know. Okay, go over to. Uh, okay, and uh, there was a letter. Uh, to the town regarding uh, the uh, flushing program. So after about three years of discussions this past fall, the Hingham Selectman's Office received an email from Aquarian, Director of Operations, to the effect that Aquarian was evaluating the possibility, evaluating the possibility, okay, of uh, a flushing South Hingham in November given that it couldn't flush that portion of the system in the spring of 17, of 2017. I think they were painting the tank at that time, and most certainly they did not have the water to waste for flushing up there. Okay, that's puzzling given the statement that in the spring of 2017 that it planned to flush the remaining portion of the system until into the summer and fall of 2017. The email went on to state that Aquarian's plan was to perform water main flushing across the entire distribution system each year. In a well-managed system, implementing best practices, annual, annual, uh, annual system-wide flushing should be customary and not noteworthy. There was a lot of publicity that was not good. Okay. That discipline would, uh, would obviously, okay, I'm sorry, absolutely result in 
gradual reduction in discolored water events. Operation maintenance recommendations, page 17. I think we went over that already, right? Yeah, I think we did that. Yeah. No, we didn't. Okay. All right. This is the last page, I promise. <laughs> Operation maintenance recommendations. Okay. They're going to issue an, uh, an RFP for water system operate, uh, operations after town meeting vote. Contractor operations maintenance O&M to, to the experienced water system operator. We're gonna, they're going to hire a water superintendent who meets the Massachusetts DEP certification and licensing requirements. Two years and two years beyond regularly capture and report performance metrics and corresponding financial data to ratepayers. In the town meeting were to vote to acquire the water system, the prepaid request would be should be and is issued immediately in the in the experienced water system operation. Ideally Existing water system employees who so desired would be considered for employment by the water system management firm. That firm and its contact with the town would be managed by a water superintendent, a full-time town employee, who would report to the town administrator and receive input and guidance from the multi-town citizen advisory recommendation by the governance study results presented July, January 16th. Under the Mass General Law, all employees responsible for either water treatment or water distribution operations and management would be certified and licensed in accordance with the Department of Environmental Protection requirements. These requirements include the regular water quality testing and reporting to the DEP, which all systems in the Commonwealth must perform. The water systems operation management firm, together with the water superintendent, should be Required to report performance metrics and corresponding financial. I just went over that. And data collection. I, I think I got everything. I, hey. If I missed anything, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bob. Yep. Um, very clear to me. 25 years of experience. You've, you certainly understand the water system business better than some of us who are more recent to it. Um, I will now ask committee members if they have any questions or comments about what's been presented. I have a question. Um, Bob, you mentioned yes, the importance of water main flushing. And um, I think you referred to um, a letter from the town of Hingham that indicated that Aquarian, if I can read the print here, yeah, that's Aquarian, uh, their plan was to, the Aquarian's plan was to perform water main flushing across the entire that distribution works. system each year. Yeah. Do we, do you have any idea, and maybe this is a question really for Aquarian, but how, has the water main, have the, and I understand the, I think I understand the significance yeah. of the water main flushing, but how frequently has it been done over the past, say, five years, the, the whole system? Uh, that, that I cannot, I, I don't know that, I, I do not know that. Okay. Okay. Maybe uh, Quarian would answer that. I probably want to speak into the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I I don't know. I you know I don't have those records. Okay. Uh, could you answer? Uh, I have a couple. Okay. Uh, Josh, go ahead. Reserve on comments until we've had a more open discussion. But uh, just a couple questions, Bob. And I don't know if you know the answer to this or if other committee members do. But in terms of the uh, reopening roads during the five-year moratorium period. It had been explained to me at some point that beyond the obvious cost of having to repave roads you just did, um, having to reopen them in, in that period also undermines the integrity of those roads. Has anybody else well, heard that? Or? Uh, well, just in that particular part of the road, okay, and, you know, the force heave cycle on a trench that's in a newly paved road that's been reconstructed and so forth and so on, it's a uh, subject a little bit differently to the frost heave cycle and you know in a year or two you may have to go back and either freshen it up or if it's sunken or if it's risen or if it's the uh, they use crack seal you know to seal it up but that difference uh, it requires the town periodically to go out and, and maintain that patch sometimes you know okay. so I think we've got uh, our 
DPW supervisor here who might be able to shed some light on that too. Randy Sylvester. Thank you. I'm Randy Sylvester, DPW superintendent. Um, when you open a new road, it uh, allows water to get underneath it and it's never the same. And water is what we what degrade, degradates the road and breaks it down. So it takes years off the asset for the town. So any time the road is open, I mean, that's why we have a five-year moratorium on it. <clears throat> and we notify all the utilities. So we don't want that road open for at least five years. Once it is, it starts to degrade in a, in a quicker fashion. That's helpful. Thank you. And it's basically due to the water. Thank you. Put the slides back up. Sure. Um, uh, Which one do you want? Page four. Okay. Uh, tell me yeah, what. Yeah, go back. Third. The one that has the chart. Yeah, that's that's the water main work. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I, I you know you talked about this a little bit, Bob, but I, I want to be clear or not clear as to what you know was being inferred from the comments that you were making. Um, obviously, there's a lot of years of doing very little, and then the huge spike in 2016, and you observed that right after that is when they um, applied for their rate case. The implication being that their motivation for doing so much at that point in time was to ratchet up their base for the rate case. Is that what we're suggesting or are we not suggesting? It's a good that? question. Okay, it's, it's just a good question. I don't know what their intent was, but they caught fire there and put about 8,000 feet of pipe in, and the next year they... So know, let, let me ask the financial guys, just factually, mm. <coughs> by doing that, they, they were able to increase the base for their rate case. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Okay. That was the test year. So, you know, people's motivations are always subject to debate and discussion, but there is a chronology there that causes some concern from, from a motivation standpoint. Bob, what, just, just to follow up on Josh's question, what, what does 1% of the system's main feet equate to, roughly? Uh, I didn't do that calculation. I'm not sure. You know, I just took the uh, information that we had from uh, Tatar and Howard studying, and then looked at the graph and stuff. Okay, uh, my my recollection is, and I'm reaching here that the system has roughly somewhat north of a million linear mm. feet. Mm. So right, we, I can do that math. That's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> multiply by <laughs> point oh one. So d basically saying that what what you've got on the right side of that slide is that Tata and Howard basically would have 10,000 linear feet a year being replaced or rehabilitated. Yep, that's correct. Okay. So, uh, well, well, another question, if I can. Is that go for um, it. Uh, before we oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, of course. Move off this chart. So, so, Bob, what you're saying down there below for the Aquarian track record, yep. where it says less than one-third of 1% 1 replaced, does that include the year 2016, the big year for the replacement? It would seem like it would. Well, it, when, we, when, I, when I try to graph it out, it, it, uh, it only came out as 1%, uh, and I did not take that out. I just included that in the... Okay. All right. So... Okay. That, that's an Aquarian chart, right? Yeah. From their mm -hmm. testimony in the rate yeah, case. Yeah, that's from the, the study. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay. okay. So first of all, I apologize that I'm slouching so much. I really, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm not being disrespectful. This is just the only way I can sit comfortably. <coughs> um, I, I want to kind of uh, reverse the question. I would love to hear from the DPW too, if they have uh, any thoughts on this question. But, you know, we talked about uh, last week the fact that you know, if there are 350 towns and 50 are MWRA, you know, virtually 300 towns are running their own public systems, right? So it, it begs the question as to, you know, from a capacity standpoint, ability standpoint, whether there is something unique about this <coughs> system or unique <coughs> about the town of Hingham that would suggest that the town of Hingham would not be able to do what seemingly every other town in the Commonwealth is doing. I mean, you've got all these years of experience. Is there, is there anything we should that, that should give us pause about our ability to take this over? Um, I don't see any showstoppers, to be honest with you. I, I don't see any, I don't see any reason why we can't uh, implement a good uh, program. We we have uh, 
have the ability to outsource engineering that we need from time to time. You know, and, and it's important that uh, that you have good engineering. And, and I was a recipient of awesome engineering, I'll be but, honest with you. But let me, and, let me ask it slightly differently, okay. right? I mean, one could, you know, posit a scenario where there's something uniquely complicated about this water system that we say, wait a, wait a minute, you know, we, maybe we shouldn't be doing this as a public entity because despite the fact everybody else is doing it, they have easier systems to deal with. I mean, did you run into anything like that in your no, house? No, the, the people I talk with uh, periodically who are water and sewer people also, you know, uh, um, at the, at the meetings that I go and stuff like that, they, they're just like us. You know, they're doing the same thing we're doing. They, they seem to be doing it successfully. Uh, they, they have to uh, go to the town for rates and stuff like that. But they, they, some of the people I've spoken with, and I don't want to get into the weeds on this, excuse me, they have been recipients of grants, financial grants, and loans for improvements in this system. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and I, I, I hope that uh, satisfies your... Yeah, it does. I, I can give you the, the exact numbers, Josh. Um, according to the DPU, the privately owned water companies service a portion or all of 14 communities in Massachusetts. That's 14 out of the 351, 4%. Of which were three. Uh, yeah, which means that 337 cities and towns are served by publicly owned and operated mm. water systems. Yep. Yeah, and I don't know if this is a fair question for you, but I mean, is there anything from a DPW standpoint that would give concern? Not at all. You might, sorry. That, that. Uh, uh, just to be upfront with you, I was an employee of Aquarian. I was the operations superintendent I operated the plant and the, and, the, and the system and water tanks and pumping stations. So I have 14 years of experience operating that plant. I'm the one who got it up online. So I do know something about the plant um, and, and the operations. As far as it being unique, the only thing uniqueness is the type of plant it is. Um, but it is it's somewhat a conventional plant. Um, it, it is an upflow clarifier, which is a little bit different. I won't get into the differences. Um, <clears throat> but that would be the only un uniqueness. Um, the operators there, I trained a lot of them at the time. Um, we never had any issues. Um, it's relatively, um, uh, <laughs> I won't say easy, but it's, it, it's a zero discharge plant. So th there are some uniquenesses in that. Can it be done? It absolutely can be done. It can be done by a town. It's the personnel that you have and the people who operate it. But everything has to be done, run through the DEP rules and regulations as they are now, I believe. And it's, it, it, it wouldn't be unique for a town to run this type of plant. Towns run all types of plants throughout the state which I've, I visited several of them. So let me put, you are <coughs> really uniquely situated here. <laughs> you have to stop using the word unique. Um, but let me put the question directly to you. I mean, given what you know about all your experience at Aquarian, your experience with the town, your experience in particular with DPW, do you have any reservations about if the town chose to take over this water system that we can do it effectively and appropriately? We could do it effectively and appropriately, absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't know. No. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. Thank that. you, Randy. Other questions from the committee? No? Okay. Uh, you answered the question that I had for you, Bob, which was did you, in your researches, see any showstoppers? And uh, you said not. So. No, and. Uh, <coughs> You know, finding the right superintendent, we're off and running. It's going to take a year or so to bridge the gap, get things going, and you know, get our capital programs up and running, and uh, operations maintenance, and uh, writing new plans for various maintenance functions and stuff. You know, 
<laughs> but I don't, I don't, you know. Okay. Um, with that, then, I will open the floor for questions from the public. Uh, as, as I've said in our previous meetings, um, please raise your hand if you have a question or remark, and I'll recognize you. Please come forward to the microphone, state your name and address, and then address your question to me, and I'll determine who can best provide you the answer. Thank you. Take my glasses off. Um, I have a very brief paragraph to read, and then I have five questions to ask you. Um, Ma'am, could you state your name and address, please? I just about to do it, yes. Um, my name is Polly Rowe. I grew up in Hingham, and since 2003, I have been a resident of Hall at Nine Rockview Road. Hingham residents will be asked to vote on a Hingham Board of Selectmen proposal that will have serious long-term impacts on a community's health, environment, and economic well-being. The Hingham Selectmen want the town to borrow $112 million to purchase Aquarian's water system serving Hingham, Hall, and North Cohasset. What comes with the Selectmen's plan is almost $100 million for water system improvements during the first 30 years of town ownership. When that new debt and its related debt service, interest to bond investors, is added in, the total commitment the Selectmen will be undertaking in making the Aquarian purchase will exceed one quarter of a billion dollars. Hull residents will be responsible for paying more than one third of the total cost. Question number one. One of the biggest flaws that I noticed in the Selectmen's summer 2018 financial analysis was the lack of infrastructure investment they plan to make in the water system. Would you confirm that this error has since been corrected and that the Selectmen's updated financial model has both the town and Aquarian investing the same amount? If the Selectmen plan to invest less in the water system than Aquarian, then would they provide us, the Selectmen, with a comprehensive list of which upgrades to the water treatment plant, water supply, and water distribution system they plan to cut? <coughs> Question number two. My understanding is that the private contractor that the town of Hingham has yet to hire to manage and maintain the water system will equal 40% of the cost that ratepayers will be paying. Um, the to date unknown cost of this private contractor has a significant impact on the town's financial analysis. The selectmen had issued a request for proposals to private contractors, but no one responded with a binding proposal. Just a 10% error in the town's cost estimate will add an additional $20 million to customers' waters, water rates. When do you plan, the town selectmen, this board, when do you plan to make public the detailed scope of work involved in the terms used to calculate your cost for a private company to operate the water system? Question three, have members of the Hingham Advisory Committee Water Company Acquisition Study Committee and Board of Selectmen yet reviewed the non-binding estimates from the two private companies that the Hingham Town Administrator solicited in order to help them understand the scope and terms of the work presented. Question four. At the 2012 Hingham Town meeting, the voters of Hingham approved spending Aquarian ratepayers' money quote, to be used by the Board of Selectmen for professional fees and costs, including, but not limited to, engineering services, financial services, valuation services, and legal services to investigate the feasibility of the acquisition, end quote, of the Aquarian water system serving Hingham Hall and North Cohasset. As a rate payer in Hull that will be obligated for the next 30 plus years to pay my share of the more than one quarter of a billion dollars and assume all the risks of maintaining, operating, and investing in a water company, I would like to know if you, meaning the town, has hired, an has hired engineering services as promised in the 2012 warrant article to investigate the feasibility of acquiring the Aquarian water system. Five, 
Please describe in detail what you know about the extent of the work and cost involved with replacing the aging, old infrastructure underneath the dunes in the Alphabet Streets and Hall. In closing, I think it's important to note that there truly is no need for a rush to judgment. The town of Hingham has and will continue to have the right to purchase the water distribution system. There is a very hefty price that all ratepayers will pay if the town hastily, hastily rushes to purchase the water system with an incomplete plan. Once the purchase has been made, there's no turning back. The price we will all pay is the degradation of our water quality and safety, compromised reliability of service, and unaffordable higher rates. Thank you for your answers to those questions, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a cut at a couple of those, and then I might ask our town administrator just to talk about procurement. Um, relative to your first question about capital plan, uh, what we heard from the Anderson tax expert on January 10th was that the capital expenditures between the model that he created and uh, Aquarian's August 13th, 2018 model were the same, or five-year plan, five-year capital plan, were the same, and then were escalated every three years by 5%. And uh, the borrowing rate for that capital replenishment was also escalated, I think, by 25 basis points every three years. So as I recollect, the slide that he showed displayed the capital expenditure in year 2020, equal between the town and Aquarian. And 2048, when the acquisition borrowing would be paid off, also the same. I think it was like roughly recollect was about $3.6 million a piece. So the, the capital expenditures were equal in, in the experts' model. Um, I, sure. Just on that point, I just want to make uh, also what I think is, is a, maybe a philosophical observation. Uh, you know, the, when Aquarian is deciding to spend money, right, it's, it's got to be looking at it in terms of can it, you know, recapture a good rate you know, from DPU, um, but also it needs to turn a profit, right? So those motivations are going to go into every decision it makes about how much money to spend in any given year. Perfectly appropriate, right? I, I'm, there's nothing intended to be pejorative about that. When they, when the, uh, if the town were to take over, right, it still is going to be, you know, burdened and concerned with ratepayer costs, right, how much the, ra the rate payers are going to have to pay. But it doesn't have that other component of, gee, if I sink more money into this, that's less than the shareholders get, right? That's just the nature, the, that, that's you know, a fundamental philosophical difference. So, uh, we're never, you know, capital improvements are, are a living thing. Over 30 years, nobody can sit here and say we would spend more money <coughs> than Aquarian or Aquarian would spend more money than us. But when you just look at it from a structural standpoint, there's greater motivation, I think, for a, a town to be investing in the infrastructure than there is for, or, or there's a motivation to invest higher, I guess, in the infrastructure than a private company might because of its balancing against its own private profit-making interests. So, I mean, that's obviously just me talking, but when you look at, at the governance issues, that seems logical. I'll take a cut at uh, your second question about the private contractor, and as I say, Tom Mayo can uh, fill in the blanks where I, I can't. Um, you're correct in that uh, there has been not a binding contract established, and I think we stated in the a previous meeting that the current thinking was that a, a RFP would be ready and prepared for issuance should Hingham, should this matter be put before Hingham Town Meeting and Town Meeting vote affirmatively to acquire. At that point, the RFP would be released. Um, with respect to errors in, or uh, an understatement, if you will, of the cost that was built into the model, 
uh, I think you're probably correct that uh, if it were off by 10 percent, and we've done sensitivity analysis, my my uh, result was about the same. It would affect the overall cost over a 30-year period by about $20 million, roughly. Um, given that the Anderson tax expert said that savings would be in excess of $50 million, I think there's still savings to be had were the town to acquire. Um, with regard to review by the committee of the non-binding estimates, um, no. I think that's really been the province of our town administrator, who is also the chief procurement officer for the town. Sure, I can speak to some of that. Um, so uh, as uh, Mr. Walsh has identified in, in past statements or questions, uh, the intent was to make the non-binding estimates that we received from our two bidders uh, public, as I had stated some time ago. Um, upon notifying the two bidders that we would be doing that, we received some uh, a request that that not occur and that they had referenced an exemption, what they felt was an exemption in the public, um, in the, uh, public records law. And so we had to look into that a little bit. Um, I've discussed it with our town council and the requested exemption uh, in our opinion does not apply. So I will now be making those uh, non-binding estimates available um, publicly. So historically, I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to do it in my intent because I, in my estimation, because I needed to prove out that the requested exemption wasn't valid. Uh, if we do that, are we going to tick them off enough that they won't, you know, bid when we do it for, if we do it for Yeah, them? so it, there, uh, it's, it's been formally requested of me, and I have no legal recourse to not provide them. Uh, I don't have a choice. And I'll be notifying that, them of that in the morning before I release it as a courtesy. But uh, the fact of the matter is uh, it's been requested, so I have to provide it. How will they be made public, Tom? Will they be I'll posted? be emailing them to the people that have requested them. I've okay. had several requests. Okay. Um, um, what was it? Uh, so I, I just heard a question from the audience that they asked if I was going to put it on the website. Uh, I don't know yet. I, I got to think about that. To Mr. Kremlitz's point, we have um, we have some bidders that have provided information in a manner that was um, listen. It's going to get out in the public anyway. Uh, I don't know that I want to be in their face about uh, making it public. I'll be providing it to anybody that asks. Um, my guess is it will make its way to the internet one way or another. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm trying to be respectful of the people who are concerned about competitive disadvantages with their estimates um, being publicized. Okay. So I'm trying to be respectful of, of those as well. Great. Thank you. you bet. Um, relative to the fourth question, um, the citing or asking, has uh, have engineering services been procured? And I would say no. I, I, what I've heard... Uh, back when Selectman Johnson presented about governance, when uh, actually the town administrator presented about engineering, uh, I don't think there's any dispute that there are a number of existing plans. And I think Bob Higgins said the same thing tonight. The Tata and Howard study, the Canoe study, um, the submissions by Aquarian during the rate case for main replacements. Uh, as well as the five-year capital plan that uh, John Walsh presented in August. I think there's plenty of plans. The real point f that I've drawn is the money needs to be spent to implement the plans. And I think what Bob, what I saw Bob presenting was that in the first year, in year one, it would probably make sense to do what other water systems periodically do, which is to retain an engineering firm and get an updated capital plan that would perhaps aggregate the various plans and update them given what's been what's transpired since 2014-2016. Come forward. When would you anticipate that they would hire set such an engineering firm to do that? I, I think what Bob said was during year one. So, okay. right. Okay. Um, and and I guess. The last question, I, d I don't think there's anybody here on this committee that can answer the question about the uh, plan for the dunes and the alphabet streets in Hull. So I'd... Right. Mm -hmm. I can speak to that if you want. 
I know all about that project. Well, yeah. okay, I think I uh, misspoke. Bob knows way more than I do, so I'll ask Bob to speak to that. <coughs> that uh, pipeline that's on Beach Avenue there from A Street to XYZ Street area that's all on Beach Avenue all the way down there, that's on the beach. It's a barrier beach. So, yes, that, that pipeline's going to have to be replaced. And the obvious choice, and I think uh, uh, Aquarian identified that recently in one of their budgets uh, about replacing that pipeline with a new 12 inch pipeline to replace that. They're going to get on the easement, if you will, or the old railroad right of way. I suspect that that's where they're going to go down to bring water to those houses all the way down to XYZ Street. So I think. They've identified that, and I thought I saw a, a number, and I'm not sure, so 950,000 or so, and that's, that's probably about right, you know. So that, that from my rec recollection, uh, I looked at that project with the Corps of Engineers one time, <laughs> the Corps of Engineers, because they want to get all the utilities off the beach, the telephone poles, the water mains, and anything else. They want that stuff off the beach, but finding a place to put it, luckily, the soil is already behind there in a lot of places, and that would be a great place to put a new water main of significant size, you know. And, um, but I think they know about it, and I think they're, they're budgeting for that, if, if I'm not mistaken. To your point, thank you for that information. Has that project, if the town of Hingham should purchase a Quarren, has that project, and I'm sure it's not the only one in Hull, has that been factored into the, your financial plan? At some point, I think it will be, yes. Like each year we'll identify and prioritize our, our capital program of pipelines. Don't forget, we want to do a balanced project in Hull and Hingham. We want to try to balance our, uh, our capital in both towns and, and a right. piece of work up there. But that certainly is going to have to happen at some point. Okay. Uh, I'll add, I, I know, I mean, I know that Beach Road uh, main repair was one of the line items in the uh, water main replacement uh, submission for the rim surcharge that became MRIM. So I would say, yeah, it's, it's known and on the radar. On the radar. Thank you all. Other questions? Sir. Jim O'Hare, 11 Heron Way in Hingham. Could we kick the slides back on, please? Sure. You remember which one? I think it might be number four or five. They're not numbered, so I couldn't catch the number. Okay. But it starts with uh, approach up on the okay, left hand I corner with a semicolon four. after that. Is that the one? Uh, you got it. Um, it's uh, the conclusions. Number one, Aquarian has consistently failed to make the necessary capital investments in our aging water system, particularly in the water mains. I guess my question is, was that statement made by the DPU? That statement, what I did was I looked at the uh, Tatar and Howard, and I looked at uh, all the numbers that uh, stated that we needed to spend so much money annually to, uh, you know, to achieve so much percentage of uh, pipeline replacement <coughs> over 30 years. This, it's, and that's what, I, that's what I came up with, okay? And when you look at page, can you go to page five again, please? Sure. What bears that out is look at that chart, okay? And look at, on the right-hand side there, okay? Th there's your numbers there, but look at the pipelines going across there. There's not a lot of pipeline work there, is there? I mean, it's just until 2017, 16, rather. So there hasn't been a lot of pipeline there. It's a tough one, I think, for non-professionals to uh, evaluate, in all honesty. I mean, there could have been other reasons, or it might not have been necessary, or perhaps there were breaks or something incorporated into that. But uh, as a um, uh, follow-on uh, question to that, uh, I have a question in the fact that I believe that Aquarian has gotten uh, four recommendations out of the last five years as to the quality of water vis-a-vis -a, -vis a large competition throughout the whole Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think a very small percentage, I don't know what that is, but it's less than 10% of the companies, both public and private, receive that. 
So that seems quite inconsistent if the accusation or the uh, assertion, perhaps, that is, was in the testimony, wasn't it? is um, that it's been inconsistent and there's been a significant and consistent uh, misallocation as far as uh, replacement. There seems to be just too big a divergence. Would you address that, please? Well, can I ask a question on that? How many towns applied for that award? I don't know the right answer to that. Oh, that that's oh, that's just piece of information. Yep. Somebody knows. <laughs> 1,700. Mr. Walsh, would you come to the microphone, please? Uh, John Walsh, Vice President of Operations for Aquarion. So the question was how many water systems apply for it. There's no application process. There's 17, just over 1,700 public water systems in the state. Many of them are municipally owned. Uh, all of them are eligible. The DEP reviews their records each year and selects the top 1 to 4 percent. And Aquarian has been in that group <coughs> four out of the past five years. Thank you. So I find that inconsistency something that ought to be considered, particularly with the subsequent slides, which also showed, I thought, a consistent um, um, slant. We won't use the word bias slant towards what hasn't been done correctly. And admittedly, none of these companies are going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect ever. The assets are underground. They're very difficult to assess. The system is old. There's only been 16 years of ownership of the present company. So there is a large number of years before that where perhaps it was under maintained. I have no idea. So I just wanted to bring that point out and that I did find that assertion to be quite powerful and somewhat misleading. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Other questions, sir? Hey, good evening. Jim Watson, 291 Rockland Street. I may have missed some of the discussion before, but I, I keep thinking, given the lack of a response to the RFP and given the presence of an experienced staff that's been running the system for years, is it really necessary to look for a new firm to take over everything? If we can get a superintendent that's sensitive to the timing issues, you know, related to road work and everything else, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you are at least still looking at that possibility. As others have pointed out, you know, they're both examples. You have large systems run by outside firms. You have most systems run by the communities. Most of those are much smaller. But here we have a present staff in place, a plant in place. And I just think, it was, I think that with effective time-sensitive supervision, uh, we might have what we need almost in place right now. Because my only question is then, are you still open to that? And I trust you are, but I just wanted to ask you that. Thanks. I think ultimately that's a decision to be made by the Board of Selectmen. Um, but I would agree with you. I think uh, we're fortunate to have <laughs> several decades worth of experience with this water system and the two individuals that have spoken tonight both uh, Bob Higgins as well as uh, Randy Sylvester. So I think that certainly gives us some insight that we would not otherwise have without that expertise. Other questions, sir? <coughs> Good evening. I'm Steve Olson with Aquarian Water, Oper uh, Aquarian Water Company. I'm the Director of Operations. I think you had one of my emails up there. Um, if you could put the slides back on. I'm just curious about the, um, the title slide again. Which one do you want? The title slide. I think this was referred to as uh, engineering phase review or, or engineering study. I'm just curious um, how many engineers were part of the study, part of this engineering study? None. Oh. Uh, in terms of this committee, I don't think, I mean, I don't want to speak so for just, Bob. It was just committee members. And the people the that with, with whom Bob and others have spoken. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. I was, I'm a registered professional engineer, licensed drinking water operator, treatment and distribution. And I guess the, the scope of the study um, seemed a little light for an engineering study, having 
being a professional engineer, so I was just curious about that. Um, and you mentioned um, some qualifications, I guess. Bob, or you mentioned you had 25 years of experience? Yeah, about 25 years. <coughs> in public water systems? No, no, private water systems. Private water systems, okay. And the, the last time that you worked for one was how long ago? Mm, 16 years ago, just before acquiring acquired. Uh, okay, all right. And you're, you're familiar and current with drinking water regulations? Barely, yes. Okay. Um, and the, the last time they were updated? Are we talking about engineering or are we exploring the his experience. credentials? And, and you referenced um, some reports, engineering reports. You re referenced Tater and Howard and Ty and Bond? No, no, Ty and Bond was a mistake. Okay. okay. It's, ta it's Tater and Howard, and I used that to garner information. It's all right there, and, and I think it's, a, it's pretty good information that we could use. Uh, we're just a board of uh, happy civilians here to try to... <laughs> I want to do some fact-checking. So I was just wondering what the title, which report it was, and what year it was. Uh, 2014. It's your report. I understand. I'm just wondering which report. We have a lot of reports by Taylor well, Howard, okay. so just wanted to reference all that. Um, going in reverse order, um, so the, the RFP um, for contract operations, I'm a little, uh, there was an RFP or there's going to be an RFP or what's, can you please clarify that? Uh, there, there was an RFP that was issued. I think uh, the town administrator has spoken about that. Uh, since then, there have been meetings with uh, other water systems and their supervisors, and I think we've got a better idea of what the next version of the RFP should look like based on those discussions. Am I right, John, that the purpose of that RFP was to get some numbers for you to be able to populate your financial analysis? That as well as uh, some other factors. I think I referenced in one of our previous meetings that the RFP that was let by the town and uh, talked about a one-year contract with options for two successive one-year contracts. Uh, after our meetings with uh, wa other water system supervisors, we we looked at what they'd done and determined that it would be a much better um, move to have probably a minimum of a three-year contract with options for additional three-year intervals, maybe more to be determined. But one year was, in retrospect, uh, too small. And actually was uh, the, the Hyannis water system basically had done the same thing, issued an RFP initially for one year and then learned from that their subsequent uh, procurement had three-year intervals. Did, did the town receive any bids for that RFP? Were the no, I don't think so. I'll no responders? No. So all we have now is um, non-binding, uh, what, was, what, was what were they referred to? Non-binding? Uh, Letter estimates. Estimates? Right. Okay, and the, the scope of work was prepared by the committee or the, the town or who prepared the scope of work on what it's going to take to operate the water system, all the things involved? The, the letter estimates themselves, uh, the, as far as I'm aware, basically spoke to the scope of work. Okay. All right. Um, you, there was quite a bit, of, a couple of slides on the flushing program, and I think one of my emails was on there. So could we go to the flushing program? Sure. Tell me when to stop. Uh, Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, Bob, you, you referenced, um, you know, we had some questions, I don't know if they were talking or not. Do we have a plan? Did we implement the plan? Um, you, you made a recommendation to, that we should let the public know what's going on when we're flushing. Um, you're also talking about flush, you're talking about this letter and how the town wrote a letter in the fall of 2018. You quoted uh, my email. Um, I think you might have misquoted me. So it was 20, the spring of 2018 when we did the Accord tank, I think you said 17 uh, mistakenly. Right. Okay, okay, that's so, fair, that's fair. So in the high zone, we couldn't flush that in the that's spring. Right, because of that. So we flushed uh, the uh, northern side of Hingham and then Hull, and then now, you know, now it's, um, I think it was, is it November time frame, late October? 
And when I said we're evaluating whether or not we can continue flushing uh, South Hingham, you know, it, it, we're looking at the weather. You know, we want to make sure that we're not putting water on the roads and creating hazardous conditions, creating freezing. So we were evaluating that, and we finished our evaluation and actually did flush the entire system. Um, so we did flush the entire system of Hingham, Holland, North Cohasset, both in 2018 and in 2017. Uh, it was not flushed in 2016 because that was a, a drought and water was not available. So we had a, a water ban in effect. Steve, so, can I ask you a question? Yes. How many times prior to 16 was it flushed? Uh, I'm not sure. I started. How long uh, have you been with those? I started here in July of 2016. Okay. Yeah. Um, and as far as I'm letting the public know, um, so this email is just one of the mechanisms. We let all town officials know in all three communities. We put uh, newspaper advertisements in. We do code reds every evening for the target areas we're flushing. Um, we put an alert on our website. Um, and we provide, uh, you know, we have a, a monthly newsletter. We put that information in there. Um, and in the hall, we also have a message board, an electronic message board. So we definitely get the word out. Um, in many different ways, so we, we do let the public know to, to answer your question. And um, to answer the other questions, yes, we do have a plan. It's a systematic plan to go through the system. Um, South Hingham is one zone, then we have uh, North West Hingham is another zone, and Eight Northeast. territory. Yeah, <coughs> and then Hull. So it, it's a systematically to go through it, um, to do, and we've found it to be quite effective the last couple of years. The, uh, the time it takes to flush or clear a hydrant is, is becoming less, so that's, that's showing some good progress. Um, there were a couple of slides on the brakes. If you could go refer to the brakes. Um, you made some comments about... Um, Why don't we find the slides? Yeah, which... Okay. The, here, or t tell me when to stop. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter the slide, but you mentioned... Um, the number of breaks and something about we weren't keeping track of where the breaks oh, were that's the and mentioning GSI, I think you meant GIS? GIS. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's so see. we actually, you know, we do have a list yeah. of exactly the street you. address and location, month and day of yeah. every single break. Um, and it's in, you know, large spreadsheets, spreadsheet annually. So it's this. those breaks aren't on our GIS database, but we do know exactly where they all are. And when you add them all up, when I was uh, back listening, I did had I had information on the last seven years. And um, breaks are there's there's an industry standard by American Water Works Association of 0.23 breaks per mile, based on the number of miles of our system, 192. That's about 44 per year. We're averaging uh, in the past seven years 30 per year. So we're well below industry average. And if you break it up by town even below that for just the town of Hingham. So breaks are not as rampant as um, the data that you presented uh, show. Um, Can I ask a question about that, yeah. uh, Steve? Because I, what I read there, particularly the first sub-bullet, yeah. I mean, this, this is a, the study, I guess, by InfraPlan, the canoe study, the simulation. Um, it looked to me as if they were referring to a study they'd done in Connecticut and were saying that they couldn't do the same thing in Massachusetts because of inadequate data. That, that's what leapt out at me. Sure. Why don't I let uh, John answer that one? Okay. He was more familiar with that. Sure. Again, John Walsh, Vice President of Operations. Uh, yeah, this comes from our testimony in front of the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, this is one example of the transparency. You can see all of this, literally thousands of pages. Um, so what's going on here is we did the KENEW study, the KNEW study, which I know you guys actually referenced in one of your documents. That is a very extensive, robust uh, analysis of our uh, piping system looking forward for, I think it's almost 100 years. Uh, and the study uh, the goal of the study is to figure out at what level uh, we should be replacing main. So how many miles of main should we be replacing each year so that there are not spikes in 10, 15, 20 years from now uh, in the need for main replacements. So what you're seeing here uh, is that, uh, as Steve mentioned, we have 
all of the water main break data uh, for many, many, many years. It's not in our GIS. What we used instead is a bigger uh, database. We've got 3,000 miles of water main in the company. And what we do is we, as part of that study, we took a look at each type of material of main, ductile iron, cast iron, uh, um, AC pipe, um, and we used that data for 3,000 miles of main to predict how often mains would break moving forward. So although we're missing the 200 miles of main in this system in our GIS database, we didn't think it was necessary to add it to our GIS database because we had data for 3,000 miles of main. One of the advantages of having a large company to have that database fully available to us. Does that answer the question? All right. Thank you. Just a few more comments. Thank okay. you. Um, also, Bob, you provided some feedback on operations and quoted some best practices <coughs> as far as collecting data. And I'm wondering, do you have that? Um, well, um, collecting data, and I did not realize you were collecting this data. Originally, uh, I used to have two big spreadsheets that I used to update every month, and that, that gave us the uh, the breaks, service breaks, main breaks, and so forth and so on. Type and kind of pipe from 24 inch all the way down to the to the one inch, and we used to use that uh, for a guide because when you look at that at the end of the year, and this was our own invention, okay, it just simply st showed the type and kind of pipe and size that would that would break the most like the two and a quarter cast iron cement line and the six, I think six inch cast iron uh, is the next next thing. And so that helped uh, help me anyhow to budget for main breaks. You know, for the number of main breaks we had, we used it for a budgeting tool, we used it for a planning tool. And that was the technology of the day. We did not have the technology that you guys obviously have. And so we did the best we could with it and that's how, that's what we did with it. And uh, it was, it was great, but it's I guess my, my question was, I thought I heard you say that um, we weren't collecting that data. We weren't collecting sufficient well, data. Or we when I read that, I said, look, data. these guys are collecting data because they couldn't offer it to the study. It's just my opinion. Oh. Okay, it's just my opinion, Steve. I'm, I'm not knocking you guys. I'm just saying it was in my opinion from what I was reading that there's a lack of data collection there. Well, do you know how we collect data? Well, I do or now. Oh, uh, I do okay. now because uh, Mr. Walsh made it available to us, but uh, I did not know that. Okay. Right. Um, there was some other information on unaccounted for water, UAW. Uh, DPU report. Yeah, you said you, there was some inconsistency. Well, did you report 17% to the DEP this year? Uh, last year, the last period of record. Uh, 17th, yeah. And for 2017, did you report 17 uh, 16 and a half. Right. But if you look at your DPU report in metered consumption, 77%, my qu that, that's what I wanted to know. Where's the 23%? How do you account so for that? So there, there is um, a 23% difference. I think you might be mixing apples and oranges. So DEP wants unaccounted for water, and that's whereas DPU, they, all, they want unaccounted for, but they also want non-revenue water. So there's a difference between non-revenue water and unaccounted for Absolutely, water. but I could not tell from this re uh, consumption meted, okay, and yeah. pumped and so forth and so on, that item number 12, consumption metered, 77%. Okay, okay. I get the question. That's Good consumption answer. metered. That's, that's your answer. That's fine. But then I had to ask the question, what about the 23%? So 23% of consumption, or 23% that's not consumption metered, means it's non-revenue. A subset of that 23% you can account for. For instance, when we flush the hydrants, we, we keep that's track of the time use. and the duration and volume, yeah, that's and then we can account for that, so yes. that reduces the non-revenue water. Is that confidently estimated mun municipal yes, use? Yes, estimated municipal use. <coughs> and we can only estimate municipal use if we get the information from the municipalities. I understand that. Fire departments and street sweeping and all that stuff. Right. We used to do that. Right. But so the but DPU I just report and the DEP report are very I consistent. I brought it up because I looked at it, and in my opinion, there was a question of 23%. Now, if you said you had 23% of uh, non-revenue use, 
That's what that number represents. So what is your unaccounted for water? Because you're accounting 16 for... Sixteen and a half percent. So you're saying about seven percent is the... We accounted for it. C we C didn't C sell it, so it's right. non-revenue. But you had to account for it. For it. Non-revenue. Right. Again, um, it's water we can measure with flushing hydrants, when there's a significant mm -hmm. break, when we get information from the fire departments and from the DPW, mm -hmm. uh, and on meter, meter corrections, we can all account for that confidently. And DEP reviews that information, and if they don't agree with it, then they make adjustments. So that's what they re reviewed and approved. Um, on uh, breaks, if we could go to the break slide. Um, oh, so I mentioned break. We did breaks already. I'm sorry. Uh, mains replaced. I, I think you um, said uh, there were a couple of slides about the, the lack of mains replaced and uh, you know a big amount of mains in 2016, and um, and not coordinating with the town's road. Um, That's road building plans. Yep. This one. And I can assure you <clears throat> that Aquarion has been closely coordinating with the town's road building plans for at least the past four or five years because I've been at those meetings with the town engineer and the town's project engineer. Uh, matter of fact, we just had two uh, two weeks ago. So we've been doing that annually. Um, well, listen, just, this you, report, just to name a few streets. Do you dispute that number, the 22%? I don't know where those uh, numbers came the from. The town engineer's report. I was able to garner information from the town engineer. So that says, I don't know if emergency street openings, if it's a break, if it's a customer request, if it's a service leak. I, I don't know what those are. Uh, I know where all, we know where all our service leaks are. We keep track of it. We know where all our breaks are. We keep track of that. Um, I'm not sure that 22% of uh, street openings occurred in roads under the five-year moratorium. I can't. I haven't looked at that information, although I, I know what the roads are, so I could match that with our streets and, and verify that. But um, I just wanted to let you know that we very closely coordinate with the DPW. We've um, been doing so for four or five years. Um, and just to name a few streets, you know, Simmons Road, Playground Road, Tower Road, Surrey, Surrey Road, uh, Sherwood, Butler, Fairview, Leonard. Um, uh, East Street, Free Street, Union Street, South Pleasant Street, and there's a number in Hull, um, uh, Atherton, Park, Sunset, Kadish, uh, and then back to Hingham, Edgewater, I'm sorry, Edgewater and Hull and Prospect. Um, so there's just, you know, many, many feet of water mains in, in the past, you know, five to seven years that we've done, and I don't think, you know, that's reflected. Um, I know there's some, uh, some discussion about Beach Ave. So Beach Ave, that's scheduled to be done in 2019. <laughs> inch main on a 12. Um, and we are going to go down the railroad bed. That's actually out for bid right now. And I uh, hope to receive bids uh, the end of this month. And we're going from M Street to Y Street and then continuing on Beacon. Because from A to M, it's, it's in the roadway. It's only from M to the to Y where it's in the, under the sand dune. Because one of your... One of your proposals here uh, was from, uh, I think it was going down Lewis Street and then down A Street and pick up Beach Avenue, go all the way down to XYZ Street. So One of our proposals? I, I think it was in the, the page right here. From the rim? Submit? It might have been on the rim page, but I, I recognized it right away. <clears throat> but we're doing you Beach Ave from M to, to Y because that's the part that's under the sand dune. From M A to M, it's it's actually in, in the paved right. under the paved. Uh, but I had seen roadway. that from Lewis Street to X Y Z Street down that right away. Okay. And I think it was nine hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Okay. Um, just a minor point. There's two pumping stations uh, with our system. Um, you might not be aware of that there's one with uh, Christina Estates on Squirrel Run Lane. So there's two pumping stations there. Um, Is that a pumping station or a yes. booster station? It's a, it's a pumping station. station. Yeah. yeah okay. It's a boosted pressure zone. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all I had for questions. Can, I, can you go to the previous slide? Can I ask you a question, Steve? Sure. sure. Um, do you have an explanation for the spike in 2016? Uh, I think it's related to um, some work we did in Ox Oxford. Um, Charlton Street and, and uh, Ross and Ave, 
a project that had been uh, got moved up due to some um, uh, feedback from the community, uh, some break history, and uh, we hadn't been doing a lot of uh, water main improvements in, in Oxford, uh, so we're playing a little so catch up in Oxford. This is service area A, right? That's not That's Oxford. just service area A? Yeah, well, I'm so just going by the slide. Yeah, I didn't, okay. I didn't create it. Um, without looking at um, information, I, I do not know. Okay. Uh, do you dispute the, the conclusions to the right about it, the investment being one third of 1% rather than 1%? Without uh, checking the numbers, I, um, I have no comment. I, I don't know okay. if it's factually correct or incorrect. All right. Did you have a? OK, OK. Thank you. OK, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, John Walsh, Vice President of Operations for Aquarion. Uh, I'm going to start with a question for Mr. Krumholtz. I heard you talking about profit and profit motive. So can you explain how private utilities make a profit? I'm not going to engage in this. Yeah, what, no, but I, I can because it's important because your suggestion is that we skimp on, so you know, we skimp on infrastructure investment. Your suggestion let's be, is that we skimp. Second. Hold on a second. You're not a citizen of this town. Right? You are part, we have allowed you to be part of this process, and I think it's important that you be part of this process because we need to hear what you have to say on these issues. As Mr. O'Hare raised, there could be explanations for a lot of things, and we've heard explanations for a lot of those things. But I will tell you, you tend to come up here and be provocative and insult. If you want to make a point, make your point, and then let's move on, okay? We are one of your largest, if not your largest taxpayer in the community. So I believe we do have a right based on that to be up here and ask questions. And we also have the right to correct the record. So in terms of profit, uh, private utilities like Aquarion, we make a profit by investing in the infrastructure. That is the way that we make profit. We take our money, we invest it in water mains, in upgrades to treatment plants, and we get a return on that investment. Like anybody investing in whatever they invest in, you expect to get a return. That is our profit. So when people talk about profit, and that's not a guaranteed profit, over time, as our expenses increase, every dollar that our expenses increase, that profit gets reduced by, uh, gets reduced by a dollar. Um, so we take the financial risk of running a water system. That does not happen under town ownership. You don't have an equity holder uh, that has to take money out of their pocket uh, or not get uh, a profit when expenses go up. Um, so I, I think it's important for people to understand that uh, we actually make money by investing in the system, not by holding off on investment. Uh, Mr. Higgins. Yes, sir. You, uh, you had a number of thoughts on water main replacement, how much should be replaced. Um, and criticisms. So um, what is the town's plan for water main replacement? We are going to take that study, that public study that you presented to the Department of Public Utilities, okay, and review it and continue to review it. And we'll use that as a basis, okay? We'll also use the basis of any other information we can garner to uh, take care of that 96,000 feet of four inch and smaller pipe. Uh, we'll integrate that. We'll integrate a uh, balanced program between Hingham and Hull as far as uh, road paving and, and uh, things like that. It's, so for I think it's important to know that I was able to use your public information, okay? I use your public information, which is a good study, and that's a good guide. And we were going to use that, and at some point we're going to have to modify it depending on uh, what we find out about our program. Are we spending too much? Are we spending enough? You know, it's, we'll be fine. So uh, the latest we've heard is your capital plan has been defined by Anderson Tax. How much money is in the first couple of years, each year? 
I think what, I'll answer that. I think what uh, Jim Dondero said on January 10th was that both the Aquarian model and his modified version of it assumed $2.7 million for the first three years and then 2.5 that was escalated by the 5% and the, the 25 basis point borrowing rate increase. So they stayed equivalent throughout the 30 year life of the projection. And how much water main replacement? Now, consider about 1.2 million a year is invested in things other than water main replacement. So of the amounts that you just mentioned, uh, subtracting out 1.2 million, how much water main replacement does that support in feet? And does that support, I don't know, you brought up paving. So all the paving programs in Hingham and Hull, the number of feet there are of, those, of that paving program, is your expectation and your plan to replace water mains under every street that's paved every year? Only those that are in the critical category. And does the capital plan that Mr. <laughs> Mr. Asher just described, does that support what you just said? I, I don't know that. I think that's the point of what Bob said, that in year one there'd be uh, a capital assessment performed. I mean, it, you're asking, the way I hear your question, John, you're asking if we've, formulated a very detailed and comprehensive plan and I would say at this point no we've looked at what Aquarian has produced in the way of plans and testimony and said looks like a good starting point particularly with the addition of the rim testimony that's now MRAM but with the with the provision as we've heard from other water systems that uh, we need to update it and probably uh, pay for other studies as well, cost of service studies and rate structures and such. So, I mean, do we have all the answers here at that level of detail tonight? And I go, no, I don't think we need to either. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a detail. When I hear uh, criticism uh, about how much investment we've made, uh, then uh, I want to ask, what is the investment that you plan to make and does your financial plan support it? We can tell you that we looked at the paving plans for Hingham and Hull, and we can see that there's millions of dollars of additional water main beyond your capital plan. Uh, so there's a disconnect between what you're suggesting you would do, because I think that's what you're doing. You're suggesting that when a road is paved, you replace the main underneath it. There is a lot of road, there's a lot more road that's paved than you can afford under your capital plan. Uh, to replace mains. John, just one thing. When, when you say our capital plan, uh, our capital plan, based on what I heard from Anderson Tax, is your capital plan. Uh, no, actually, as you noted the other day, he made an error. He picked up uh, a document from us that was not, that's not our capital plan for uh, service area A. I think you recognized it the other day. That's the, it's, it's that clearly the plan in Massachusetts. The Massachusetts. Right. I, so the numbers that were as big as they were actually included Oxford and Millbury. And they didn't include MRAM. So right now, I think I mentioned this the other day, we have a five-year capital plan that amounts to $22 million over the five years. The money that uh, Anderson Tax put into your five-year plan, if I was following what he described correctly, was $16 million. Mm -hmm. So there's a $6 million difference between what we plan to invest over five years and what the town but would But he also didn't put the increased MRAM rates in either. Right. I mean, they did it apples to apples, right? Yeah. He, he kept so the capital what's the, what's equal. The, difference? The, the question I've got, John, and it, uh, it's the chart that, that talks about the, the water main feet replaced from 2005 forward. I agree completely with your statement just a little while ago that it would absolutely be in the interests of a privately owned, investor owned utility to maximize the capital investment over time because you're going to earn a return on that equity. And I think in the current rate case, what was approved is 10.5% return on equity. Why is it that there was such a period of what I also see uh, when I saw that chart for the first time of underinvestment when it would have been in Aquarian's interest to have maximized? Why? Yeah, I don't know what the water, water mains are not the only assets in the system. That. So I don't know from that graph for the, for the years, you know, years ago, what else was being invested in. Um, I know that we increased the investment uh, in the last five or six years. And part of that is 
uh, folks like me uh, saying this is where we need to invest in this water system. So part of it is definitely motiv motivated by individuals, uh, both me and Steve included, uh, being able to prove and justify the folks uh, that the investments needed. One thing that you have to balance, and uh, you know, I'm sure that you have thought about this, you cannot just invest everything that you want to invest in terms of dollar volume. Because what that will do is that will drive up rates. Um, if there's anything that puts a boundary on how much we invest, that is it right there. Because we project out five years every year and we take a look at what could happen to rates. And uh, we are very prudent investors because we don't want rates uh, to, uh, to increase unreasonably over time. Okay. Bear with me one minute. Sure. Um, I would like to second what this gentleman said. In terms of our performance, uh, you guys have already, the, the award has already been brought up. That is a very selective <coughs> award that the state agencies make based on objective data that they look at. And we got that four out of the past five years. as a very select group of utilities that get that. Uh, on top of it, as Steve mentioned, main breaks are averaging 30 breaks a year across this whole system. The industry average is 40. Unaccounted for water, you saw the graph up there. One thing that you didn't point out is how it's come down. It's come down 35% in the last four years. And we did that without spending tens of millions on water mains, which is what some communities would do. Uh, unaccounted for water is a particularly difficult issue for the in industry wide. Uh, our regulator reviewed uh, everything that we are doing re relative to unaccounted for water, uh, everything we've done for the last couple of years, our plans moving forward. And in the rate case documents, one of their final statements in there is that Aquarian is taking this <coughs> issue seriously. Um, and their only recommendation was that the communities of Hingham and Hull, Hull be uh, respond take care to report their usage at hydrants to us so that we can account for that water. Uh, so that is our regulator who had positive things to say about it. And again, we didn't spend uh, millions and millions of dollars to solve it. And. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Sylvester, you want to come up? <clears throat> I just have a question about if they didn't spend millions of dollars and they reduced their unaccounted for by 35%, how do they actually do that? That's my question to John. <laughs> Obviously, this, these folks aren't going to answer that question, Randy, so I'll ask <laughs> Mr. Walsh to come back up. So unaccounted for water, you measure the water leaving your facility, you measure your water going into uh, homes, uh, and the difference between those two numbers is non-revenue water. But unaccounted for water, you can account for portions of that non-revenue water. Um, but it starts with one, making sure your meters are accurate, mm -hmm. testing them, recalibrating <coughs> them. Uh, probably the biggest thing that we did was starting in 2014, we did leak detection system-wide every other month for, I believe we did it for a full year. And we found, uh, I believe it was over 80 leaks found and fixed them. That had a big impact on this. And let me compare this to what is recommended uh, by the state. The state recommends you leak detect system-wide once every two years. We went out there and did it once every two months uh, and we're able to do that at a fraction of the cost of most folks because we have teams of people in our company who leak detect year-round and that's all they've been doing for many 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 years. So they're very good at it um, and uh, it's also right-sizing meters at some big users, so some big facilities, too big a meter, 
water goes through their meter and doesn't register. Uh, so there is a long list of things. It's in our testimony um, because these same questions were asked. The same question he asked was asked uh, in our testimony, and we provided that list of actions we have taken. Uh, so this is a success story. Aquarian has absolutely brought that number down, and there's still more work to get it down further. Okay. Thank you. I, you know, I, I do want to make a point on this <coughs> issue of non-revenue water uh, and water usage. Back, and you two gentlemen are aware of this, back when we bought this system, uh, they were using not only more water, pulling more water out of the wells and out of the reservoir uh, back before we acquired it, s more than we're pulling out of the reservoirs and well now, and more than the state allows. That resulted in a significant consent order. That's a big deal. A consent order from the Department of Environmental Protection. Aquarian acquired the system. We resolved that consent order. And uh, year after year now, we are withdrawing less water from the environment than was withdrawn back in the late 90s. Uh, so that is, again, a success story. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Richard Norman, Three Shirt Avenue. Uh, I've spoken in the last two meetings. Uh, have uh, 30 plus years of managing a couple of energy companies of similar size to the Aquarian Assets. Uh, frankly, I arrived here tonight and expected to see a discussion about what the town was going to do to actually achieve an operating capability following its purchase of the Aquarian Assets. I haven't heard any of that as of yet. Um, and so I asked this question uh, before the governance meeting last week, and I'll ask it again. With respect to tonight, is there going to be a discussion, and there may be other people uh, who are going to talk about engineering and operations, or are we going to just have an opportunity to comment, and then you're going to have your discussion and your vote? Because frankly, when I saw the agenda item today, I sat there and said, they're going to vote tonight? So that's my question, first. Uh, I'll answer that. I think the, given what we were tasked with studying back with uh, the appointment of this committee at the Board of Selectmen after town meeting 2012, um, I think we were tasked with looking at three areas. Uh, at the level of detailed plans, as we were discussing earlier, I'd say no, but uh, at the level of feasibility and advisability, I would say yes. And so that's, I think, the level at which we're I, I guess that's the question which I had and have, because to the best of my knowledge, there's been virtually no detailed discussion in the selectmen's meetings. My ex expectation, my understanding, was that this is the committee that was going to put a plan together that both the selectmen and the voters of Hingham could look at in detail and satisfy themselves that they could make a financial commitment and effectively operate the water operations. Um, I assume all of you are here. We all live in Hingham. It's a pretty prosperous town. I know all of you have had a lot of professional experience. Um, I don't know how many of you have been through a loan closing, but I have been through several of them. And I know the documentation and the plans that are needed to satisfy a lender before they're going to lend me some money. These three meetings this week have fallen far short of a detailed plan for a town like Hingham to commit, and these are my numbers now, over $250 million, $112 million for acquisition debt, uh, based upon the Anderson study, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's another 60 to 90 million dollars. Add in the debt service, 250 million dollars, and I think the current outstanding debt of Hingham is 68 million dollars. So, if I start off, and I look at the Anderson report. Um, Editor John, um, I know at the last meeting, the financial meeting there was a statement made 
that you had yet to see the financial model for Anderson. Has that been made available? Not yet. We have not seen it. Not yet. So if that hasn't been made available, then to the best of my knowledge, if the Anderson study is the basis upon which to look at the financial advisability, I think there are two, gra two graphs in the Anderson report that was submitted. This one is apples to apples. 2020 to 2048 perspective. List estimated operating costs, debt service, profit, capex, depreciation, and revenue requirement. The second statement is apples to apples aligning assumptions. Operating cost inflation, capital expenditures, costs and increases, and interest rates. So I guess I'd ask, is, is this the basis upon which you would propose to go forward and recommend that the town has a financial plan that basically is going to make it worthwhile to go ahead and, and commit to borrowing or debt service costs of $250 million? I, I think a quick answer would be yes. I mean, there's what the Anderson tax expert said was that he used a different approach than the approach that Ed and I had used, uh, which was top-down. He produced a much lower number than we, our analysis, had produced uh, based on our estimates. And I think, frankly, the, the prudent thing to do is to use the more conservative of the two approaches, which was the bottoms-up cost build-up analysis that Anderson tax used. So. If, again, if the issue is to determine feasibility and advisability from a financial analysis perspective, my conclusions after that presentation on the 10th were that it was feasible, there were savings with town ownership, and advisability, I think, is in the matter, you know, in the eye of the beholder, but certainly feasible. I don't know. Ed, do you have any? I, I think, Dick, the, the $50 million that, that Dondero presented, I think if you go back to comments that both he made and uh, Julie made from uh, Barry Dunn, you know, I, I work backwards to, from, a, from the Anderson revenue number. And determined that he used a compound revenue rate annual increase of 7.01 percent to get to his number. We used a significantly higher, well, when you compound it over 31 years, we used a rate of 8.06 percent. Julie said, you know, that's conservative. Anderson said that's conservative. If you, if you used that higher rate of 8.06% compounding versus the 7.1, it's $71 million additional revenue. That the, the delta becomes 71 million addition to the, to the 50. So I don't know, I, I, well, I'm not even proposing that. No. Or, well, but to me, it's conservative, okay. the 50. It, it might surprise you, but I've become pretty convinced Yep. based upon the Anderson study, yep. that in fact there's a financial argument as to why the town should own, the, uh, should make the acquiring purchase. So I want to be, you know, that, that's as a yep. result of the process, as a result of looking at, at the various studies. But I then look at the July 18th financial update, which you presented to the financial, to, to the selectmen. And if I'm a voter and I go to town meeting, or if I'm a selectman, I would expect to, to see a similar document prepared by the, your study committee. And in it, and I'm not going to go through each and every page, but there are O&M expenses and the like. And significantly, there are two pages, one of which shows debt service. The debt service that was in here was level principal, it wasn't level payment. And more importantly, there was also a debt service projection with regard to borrowings necessary to do capital projects. Where if we go back to the Anderson study, there was a significant difference in the two years that they showed 
between the $2 million that was included in this projection and 2048, where the Anderson study showed that the town would borrow $3,694,000. Now, given the fact you haven't looked at the financial projections, if, if I asked you today, how much are you going to have to borrow to support the capital investments under that are incorporated into the Anderson projection? I, I don't, do you have an answer? I think we'll get one when, when, when the town receives the model. Pardon? I think we will we'll know that answer when the town receives a copy of the model. And, and don't you think that before you take a vote that you ought to know that answer and you ought to be able to present that to the selectmen much the same as you did a financial update? I, I don't see how for the commitment that's necessary for the town that you could just sit there and say, essentially, yes, we're going to give you the numbers later. Because I think that's not a charge of your committee. I think your, your committee is charged, essentially, from my perspective. I'm, I'm the lender. You're the borrower. I think you're charged with putting together documentation that basically supports the recommendation which you're going to make on financing. So with that, let me then turn to governance. Well, let me just respond uh, to the point you just made, Nick. Um, what Jim Dondero said in answer to a question about, I think, MRAM, was that were capital to be increased uh, above what he had built into the model, that the delta between the town and Aquarian models, or I'll say the Anderson and Aquarian models, would stay the same. So. I think the, where, where my head is, anyway, is that the amount of capital that gets expended clearly has a limit, but it can be increased and the savings are still there. So I come back to the point I'm making about what our committee is, was tasked to do, which was to examine and investigate feasibility. Uh, to get to the level of detail that you're querying, I, I go, Ed and I will certainly be able to do that once the model is received, but I'm very comfortable that the savings will continue to exist based on Mr. Dondero's statement on January 10th. Well, that then turns, because, you know, I've written a couple of articles, and that then turns to my follow-on statement, which is, I think your financial projection, you may move it a little bit. I think the financial projection shows that there can be substantial savings, provided, however, that it's governed and operated in a way that you can achieve those savings. Mm -hmm. And what I was surprised at and troubled by is the discussion then with the governance and operations meeting last week, in which the governance and operations presentation to the selectmen in September 11th of 2018. Preparing for the meeting, I got this, I got this, I read it, and I said, okay, how does this governance and operation pre um, presentation conform to what's being said in the meeting and what people's expectations are? And when I went through that, there were a couple of things that I wanted to point out tonight, and I'm going to try and hold it to a short thing. Um, the page that says Board of Selectmen is Water Commissioners. It says in MG 41 Section 838, I think it is, this statute also speaks to rate setting and emergency water. Uh, my understanding was that that there would be no governance, certainly by the DPU, but there was some wording in here which raised questions about whether the DEP would have any authority, either direct or indirect, with regard to rate regulation. I mentioned that quickly last week. I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's an open question for me. If I go on to this page, which is entitled Employees and Vendors. It states the town will hire a water operating company 
and a vendor for capital projects. That was discussed. Do you have a page number? Uh, I don't believe there are page numbers. No, it should be in the lower right. No. Oh, I have. Oh, mine does. No, I don't think okay. so. Okay, just show, show me. 14. 14. Okay. 14. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. And that was discussed in the meeting. And, and I think between Mr. Kromrutz and Mr. Rasher, they looked at, at this and said, you know, we've heard some comments. It makes sense for the vendor really to be administered by the operating company. And I think that's exactly right. But my problem is it says here something different. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that to the extent that you're going to vote, that you will at a minimum identify those things you're voting on which are different from what has been shown to the town before. If I go on, and I don't have too many more here. Nick, can I just res respond to that? Sure. I mean, you know, th this, is, this is a process, right? I, I will say flat out, you, you know, you have educated me, um, and, and, I, and you have caused me to think harder about what the transition issues may be and all the work involved and who's going to do it. Uh, the, you know, and so I'm more educated just from that one meeting than I was prior to that. I think the selectmen are more educated now than they were, you know, the time before or the time before that. You're absolutely right that, you know, by the time of town meeting, if there is an affirmative recommendation, it has to be a very clear presentation of what is being recommended. But, you know, that, that is a process which this is just a part of, right? I mean, I don't think this committee is going to say, here are all the, the steps that should be taken in transition, uh, whether members, as we go forward, are, are asked to give our views because we've been educated. We may do that. Whether we're called as a committee to sit with another committee to give our thoughts, that may happen. So, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, um, and I agree with the big picture, uh, it, it being that, you know, we need to make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed in terms of this is the best way to go forward um, by way of recommendation if indeed the decision is made to go forward. But there's definitely going to be inconsistencies. I, I mean, there's inconsistency. I mean, my thought, these guys, you know, Steve changed my mind on a couple things from what Bob said just today. I mean, you know, that's just the nature of the beast, right? So I, I guess I'm having a little trouble understanding what the larger I point guess, is. I guess my problem is that I represent a group of voters who are very cynical about the transparency that's been followed to date. Mm -hmm. I have no confidence that there will be any more transparency if you vote in favor of the purchase. I'm mm -hmm. speaking very frankly, but okay. if you vote, the selectmen are going to say yes, and we're going to go from there. And my concluding comments, I'm going to give you a different, uh, a different suggestion. But to be specific again about governance, um, it mentions an enterprise fund. It's, it's also in the financial area. My assumption is that the borrowing can be segregated. The concern that I have is, as everyone knows, there's a lot of capital needs in the town, and I think there needs to be much more specifics, there needs to be more specifics provided given the magnitude of the debt that would be incurred here. Because, you know, as, as I've said and other people have said, once you buy it, there's no turning back. And now is the time to take a look at what should or should not be done. And so that was all that I had on governance. They then turned to operations. And again, preparing for this meeting, there's the engineering report dated August 2018. That's what the citizens have had available to them. So the first place that I turn is on page 9. And there's a statement in here. Uh, where it talks, the title is Town's Initial Approach to Daily Operations and Maintenance. And there has been really no discussion about looking forward. Uh, no question that there were a lot of service problems with, with, with Aquarian. Uh, the, 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 and it's, it's not worth spending any time on it. The suit, I think, brought a change in operations and whatever. 
it's not my purpose to try and defend Aquarian. I think they do a decent job. In my mind, the question is, can the town save money and do it with appropriate assumption of risk? So it says that talking here, um, how will the town identify a quality, quality water system operator? This gets the transition because I don't think there's any funds that have been appropriated. I don't know whether there is a source of funding, but the question that was brought up in the operations meeting is, how do you go from here to there? Uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't turn a key and, and all of a sudden start operating. So you've got to find a water system to supervisor. I would think that that's going to take a little bit of time, and it probably can't occur until a town meeting vote that says yes, and so this, and, and you, can, you can apply this to, to identify a water supervisor. The water supervisor, I think, has to be an integral part of negotiating an operating contract. I thought one of the things that we'd find tonight is you were going to sit there and say, we've identified an operating company, and here's who it is, and here's what we're going to do. Obviously, that wasn't the case. So in my mind, there is a question of, about timing, and I'll leave it at that for that one. I then go on, and the next page, page 10, says, what is the minimum criteria for a water company, uh, water company operator? And it lists a number of qualifications. And I was uncertain looking at the words that are here about how billing is going to be handled, how uh, on-call, 24-7 capability is going to be handled, about interface with the ongoing regulation, re, re, DEP in particular, although if you get into, the, into Hall and get into the sand dunes and the like, you probably are going to be dealing with the core or with other federal agencies. Um, I'll leave it at that in terms of, of regular reporting and, and whatever. And this gets to the point that I tried to make that in order to have an O&M contract that's going to work and protect the town, you need to have knowledge when you're negotiating it. If you don't, you're either going to have financial or you're going to have operating, you're going to have legal problems. And right now, I don't believe, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, I don't think that expertise exists within the town of Hingham at this point. So you've got this timing problem, and with it, you've got the need to do financing. You've got the need to do a number of other things that just don't exist at this time. And I don't think that that's in the financial plan, nor do I think that there has been money allocated to basically move that process forward. When you talk about how the town will identify and prioritize capital needs, um, I neglected to, to point out in the governance proposal, there's a flat out statement that says there'll be a, a municipal agreement between Hull and Hingham. And I think I'm not gonna be around for certainly the 30 years of this agreement, but there will come a point in time, and I'll put a pretty good <coughs> wager on this with Bob Higgins or anyone else, that you're going to find capital needs in Hull that are disproportionate to Hingham. And it's worth protecting both the ratepayers in Hingham and Hull to understand that and to come to some agreement. And as I said before, everything is fine. And Mr. Crumholz at the last meeting said, well, I don't think we need an agreement. I, I couldn't agree with you more, disagree with you more strongly. You need to protect this town and you need to protect Hull and there needs to be transparency and a municipal agreement needs to be drafted. I asked the specific question, is there one? Um, I wasn't answered. I'm not sure whether you have an answer. There, there's not one presently. Yeah. And, and based upon the discussions, there's, in my mind, it's unclear um, if your view holds, there may not be an agreement the governance agreement 
which the selectmen reviewed, said there will be an agreement. Um, and as I say, it's personal opinion, but the experience that I've had in business, as I said earlier, said when something goes wrong, it's words on a piece of paper that govern what you do. Yeah, and I think Dick, that's, a, that's an example of evolution, right? Because I think there was initially a feeling that we had to have one, uh, and then there was a conclusion um, that we don't have to have one, but I'm sure there will be a discussion about whether we should have one and what it should look like. Don't, so, don't you think, and, and at what point will there be an agreement in place? Is that, is that before the town vote, town meeting vote? I'm saying, you know, this is part of a process. I'm, you know, I'm, I, d I don't know. I mean, you're ta you know, you're getting into very good questions which you've raised, which is the transition would be a long, complicated, and detailed one. I don't think there's any doubt that that would be the case. And as I said, you've raised a lot of good points in that regard. Um, I don't think it's our place to go through what would be a 50-point list of all the transition items that would have to occur. As I said last time, I think you should be careful what you wish for because we may, somebody may be asking you to help do that. Uh, but you know, it, this is uh, that process is. It, it, if there is a vote in favor, that process will take as long as it takes. And I don't know if that's three months or a year. Where I disagree with you, maybe you don't have 40 points, but you've certainly got more points than what's been presented in these three meetings in terms of at least identifying where the inconsistencies are between what the voters have been presented in the selectmen meetings and the discussions that we've had here and in communicating to the selectmen the basis of whether you, you accept none of my public comments and you accept all of John Walsh's or whatever. Again, I think it's not a yes or no vote. I, I'm um, just going to make a comment here. I. I really want to echo what Josh has said. Um, I, I think a couple of things. One, in terms of um, transparency, I think the documents that are posted and that we've posted really since the committee was formed in 2012, and now I think there's <laughs> a couple thousand pages worth of them, are precisely an attempt to be transparent and to inform the public what we think we know at that time. And, and I don't dispute at all that some of the things that you're citing from the model as of July of last year or the uh, governance presentation as of September that, as Josh said, have changed as we've had further discussions or, in the case of financial analysis, heard the expert reports. And, and I would put that in the context of what I believe this committee is, was charged to do back almost seven years ago, which was to look at the level of feasibility and advisability. Does more work need to be done and, and will it be done? And I would say yes to both. I, I, I've never thought that this committee was charged with doing all, getting all of that done in the absence of other resources that the Board of Selectmen and Town Administrator would bring to bear. And I, I still see it that way. Uh, I think what we're going to do tonight, when we're done with this discussion, is basically uh, each of us uh, answer the question, do we think this is feasible and advisable, given what we were tasked to look at? But I, I don't think we're answering the question, is it all done and wrapped in a bow at this point in time? And I think the answer to that is no. But it, I think, as Josh said, and I strongly agree with it, before town meeting arrives, I think more will be done. And I'm, I believe a lot of the questions that you've presented and that others have as well will be answered, have to be answered. Well, I, I had some questions about the, the allowance for capital, I, I think John Walsh picked up on some of them uh, as to the fact that this wasn't all water mains. Um, there's a statement in here again that says the capital allowance would be $2.3 million per year. The old financial plan was two. The Anderson one is something different that we haven't seen. <coughs> those are, those to me, to me are details. Mm -hmm. I, I think they, I think that they can be ironed out. Yep. So, One of the other, just, uh, no, I'm not, I won't even get up. So 
I've taken a lot of your time. Um, I appreciate you've all spent a lot of hours. And uh, if I've been insulting, I apologize. I don't mean to be. Um, when I, when I tried, tried to think about you know, wh what, what do I think should be done, I, I think your committee has sufficient basis to say that it is potentially in the interest of the town to buy the acquiring assets, but that the plans for operations and governance are yet incomplete. I think it's totally inappropriate for the selectmen to expect the town voters to understand this proposal sufficiently given the magnitude of the capital assets. And I don't think that the vote should be taken at the normal town meeting. I think all of you <clears throat> now recognize that there's going to be a transition period. And who knows whether it's two months, three months, six months, but it's going to be at least two or three months before a lot of the details, people can be hired, there can be an overlap in operations and whatever. And what I would hope that you would recommend to the selectmen, and what I would hope the selectmen would adopt, is a plan in which the Warren article would request a sufficient number of dollars, and I don't know whether that's 100000 or 200000 or $300,000, mm -hmm. with which to go out and complete a really good analysis so that you could justify to a lender the fact that you're going to commit $230 million. Biggest project I've ever done was $25 million, and I know what we had to go through for that. And as someone said in one of the other meetings, there's no way in the world a, a multi-billion dollar company would commit to a $250 million asset based upon what's gone on before. I think there ought to be a special town meeting. And to the extent that the additional work is done, it's a good investment. And if the ans satisfactory answers can't be put to the unanswered questions or holes in the presentation right now, all right, People have, have got a basis upon which to vote against it. I think you've got a very good shot at getting a favorable vote. But I don't think it's going to come at the town. Well, I don't know what will happen at the town meeting. I know from my perspective that if you recommend the purchase, and if it's the selectmen, and I think you're under very, very heavy pressure right now to come out with the decision, to come out with the decision very quickly. And as usual, I speak pretty frankly. And if you do come out with it, I fully expect the selectmen and purchase proponents to push this thing to town meeting. And that just is an inappropriate thing for this town to do, given the amount of money. So in closing, I look each one of you in the eye. And in your professional capacity, or if you own the town, I would ask you, now I understand, John, your looking at this thing from a feasibility perspective. Mm -hmm. But I, I think your charge is, 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 more, is more broad not, or more narrow than that. And I think more needs to be done. And you do a great service to the town to recognize the fact that there's more work to be done before the voters get pushed to vote for or against the purchase. Thank you. Well, uh, I'll just echo what Josh said, Dick. Um, in no way have I heard any of your questions or comments as insulting, and um, I think we've all benefited from them, truly. Um, I think I said, and I'm being a little repetitive, I completely agree more work needs to be done before this goes before town meeting. I, uh, I'm not sloughing the point, I don't think, that uh, when we vote tonight about feasibility, uh, that is not a statement that the work is done. And, and I think a lot of the issues that you've raised, particularly given your decades of experience in the utility business, are very helpful. And Josh was kind of kidding the other night when he said, would you like to sit on the panel? But, I mean, as you know, we've, Ed and I have met with you a couple of times and, and benefited from that in terms of our financial analysis and modeling. So um, I... I, I agree with your statement, what the timing is, whether or not the selectmen put this forward, regardless of how this committee votes, uh, is really a decision that's going to be made by the, the Board of Selectmen. But 
Uh, that decision has been made already. Well, I, but I, I would say one more thing. And, and in terms of um, us being under pressure, uh, no one has been pressuring us in terms of timing. Um, the warrant closed last night, I guess. Um, I think w what we've tried to do, I mean, we were, as I tried to explain in the, with the timeline presentation on the 15th, we were really gated by a series of, of milestones, the, the, the litigation being the most time consuming of them. And frankly, as I know you know, the, the rate case and the amendment to it. And un, until October 31, Ed and I really didn't have the data to even update our model or for the town to retain third party experts. So uh, where I've been coming from personally, and I'll just speak for myself, is we're, we're done with what I think we've been chartered, charged to do. We've been asked by the selectmen on their, in their December 11th meeting to, to make a recommendation and we will vote a recommendation tonight, yes or no. But I, I absolutely think more work needs to be done before this goes before town meeting. And I, I believe it will be done, but um, I, I think I think it's valuable to get the, the input we've received so far, and I think there'll be, uh, if, if the selectmen determine to put this before a town meeting, whether annual or special, there'll be lots of hearings, maybe public forums and other venues where more <coughs> refinements can be provided. Whether studies get um, uh, initiated to, to along the lines you're suggesting again. I mean, that's that's really the call of the town administrator and selectmen, but uh, I, I don't think we're purporting to have represented all the answers at this point in time, and I, and I do think we've tried to update the public periodically in, in the presentations that you see that have been posted that over time get uh, somewhat superseded as later developments occur. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Jim O'Hare, 11 Heron Way. I have a lot of empathy for your position that you've just explained. However, uh, there are, and I haven't counted this on my calendar by pulling out my calendar, but there's something like 85 days between now and town meeting. That's an awful lot of water over the dam between now and then. So I might take a little exception, having been involved in mergers and acquisitions and also been an employee of companies that have been both merged and acquired <coughs> by other companies. There's a heck of a lot of water that goes over that proverbial dam in that period of time. So to, somebody's got an enormous amount of work to make this presentation effective between now and April 22nd, which I think is the uh, uh, ordinary day, the fourth Monday in um, April. Thanks. Thank you. Ma'am? Thank you. Uh, Polly Rowe, Rockview Road, in Hall. Um, I am really, really nervous after everything that I've just heard tonight, and I'll tell you why. Two things. Number one, I am a homeowner. And I took a class as a first time home buyer before I bought my home in Hull. And I am known as one, aside from the fact that I'm a career teacher, to do my homework. And I did my homework very thoroughly before I started looking for homes. Had I found, I, first of all, I'm one of the types of people I want to know up front in advance the terms and conditions of any purchase I'm making, particularly a big purchase. Had I discovered when I was house hunting issues that really concerned me in this case about operations and about governance, whatever, I would have immediately, that would have been a no-brainer to me, I don't care if they're giving the house away. I'm not interested. It spells danger. My point is, the financial aspect of it 
as I said, the first night of this meeting is only one aspect. When there are so many other unknowns yet to be determined, conflicting information, so forth, that for me precedes the financial. So that's, for me, that's very, very important. Secondly, the other thing that makes me very nervous, because I think it poses tremendous danger to both communities, I should say to all communities involved, and that is the MOU. I personally, as somebody who has attended all the acquiring forums, walked to the Hingham Board of Selectmen's meetings, gone to the Hingham Advisory Committee meetings, and attended all three meetings, my head is spinning here. One minute I'm hearing there's no MOU, there's no need for an MOU. The next minute I'm hearing there may be one. I'm hearing all kinds of things. The other night, Friday night, on my own, I decided I'm just going to poke around online a little, see what I can find. Um, I'm, not, I'm not like the experts that have spoken for us tonight between you know the aquarium officials and Mr. Norman and others. Um, as a citizen, and a, a, one who tries to inform herself, I was surprised. I looked at various different towns, the one I live in, <coughs> in Hull, Cohasset, Hingham, others, whether it was sewer or other things. Everywhere online, I'm seeing intermunicipal agreements, like documented. I also happened to discover um, in 2012, the Our Town Manager, Hull Town Manager, Phil Limnios, had spoken before, there's a whole article on this online, he had spoken before the Water Supply Committee, I think is the title, I don't have the article here in front of me. <coughs> and at that time, he not only advocated on behalf of an intermunicipal agreement that would benefit all towns involved, he also used as a model as an exemplary model, the regional dispatch center, and I know he has spoken about that, you know, in these meetings. And when he was referencing that as a successful example, he said um, that in terms of equity, the amount charged to each town would be related to their proportionality of the volume of calls. I don't know myself, and it deeply, deeply concerns me and perplexes me why Hall's town manager would have advocated for an MOU in 2012 to a Hingham Water Supply Committee, and I haven't heard it advocated here on behalf of whether it's Hall, Hingham, Cohasset. So I don't know if others watching this on TV tonight feel as I do, but I don't have words strong enough to say how profoundly I concerned I am that this community could be entering into a 250 plus million dollar purchase and something like an intermunicipal agreement, formal, written, details all ironed out well in advance before people vote on it, that we don't even know if it's going to exist, much less the nature of it. So thank you for hearing my concerns, and I have to think I'm not the only one that, that feels this way. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? No? Comments? OK. Well, then I will say that that concludes the committee's review and discussion of engineering and now move to the uh, last item on our agenda. Uh, as I think I referenced just a little while ago, the committee was charged by the Hingham Board of Selectmen at its meeting on 11 December to review available information related to potential purchase of the water system and report back to the board with a recommendation. We've met four times since that time. First on January 10th to hear the two third party experts present the results of their reviews of the town's financial analysis. Then on January 15th, committee member Ed Siegfried reviewed financial analysis in its entirety and conveyed that there was neither a showstopper nor any error in the town's financial analysis effect confirmed by the Anderson tax expert. On the 16th, uh, Josh Krumholtz reviewed all of the considerable work done to date on governance and communicated again that he perceived no showstoppers in the town's approach. And finally, earlier this evening, Bob Higgins reviewed the town's approach to engineering, 
Speaking from the perspective of 25 years experience with this water system and communicated that he perceived no showstoppers associated with the town's approach regarding engineering, which also which capital improvement operations and maintenance. So having completed presentations and discussions about the three phases investigated by the committee, I believe it's now time to consider a recommendation from the committee back to the selectmen. And so I offer the following motion. I move that the Water Company Acquisition Study Committee recommends that the town exercise its statutory rights to purchase the water system serving Hingham, Hull, and North Cohasset. Do second. I have a second? I have a second. Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to ask is that each member, and we'll do it in the order of our presentations, uh, vote. So Joe doesn't get to say anything. Say again? So Joe doesn't get to say anything. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's, so that's right. He's uh, saving, saving him for next to last. Um, ask about do you vote in favor of that motion or against it? And if you want to add anything to the rationale for your vote, I'm fine with that. So, Ed, we'll start with you. Um, uh, before I cast my vote, I, before I cast my vote, I do have some comments. Um, I think there's been a great many very thoughtful and constructive comments tonight, and I appreciate those. Um, it's uh, not easy to distill almost seven years' worth of work down to uh, a few comments, but I will do my best. Um, I'm going to cast my vote, recognizing that, as was said tonight uh, so very well, that there is uh, more work to be done over the next th virtually three months. Um, but having worked on this assignment for almost seven years, I think the time has come to make a recommendation. Um, there has been a great deal of favorable and compelling financial data, facts, and history that we've analyzed over the past almost seven years. And we have presented this information. And the information has been reviewed and verified by two financial firms. As I said a little earlier, my belief is that the uh, savings number presented in the Anderson um, financial model is reasonable. But I do happen to think that it is a conservative estimate. Uh, James Dondero of Anderson verified that there were no errors in the town's financial model. And this is despite Aquarian's repeated claims that there were errors. Uh, in my opinion, the committee has also dealt reasonably with the governance and engineering phases of the work. I believe that the time has come for the town to take over the ownership and operation of the water company. Uh, realistically, this is most likely the last time that the town will have to decide on this. Um, I doubt that um, there would be another group that would put in, maybe, a seven years worth of work on the issue. Um, I think it's time that the town joins with 337, 337 other communities in Massachusetts that own and operate their water systems. Only 14 communities, as I said earlier, in Massachusetts are served in whole or in part by privately owned water companies. That's 14 out of the 351, or 4%. That means that 96% of the cities and towns in our state are served by public water systems. I believe Hingham, Hull, and a portion of Cohasset uh, could be best served by being in that group. 96% is a significant number. I also ask myself, uh, why doesn't Aquarian want to sell? And why did Eversource buy them last year? It is, the answer it is, I believe, it's because Aquarian makes a lot of money, a significant amount of money, selling us water. In my mind, there's no reason why they're spending so much on newspaper ads, robocalls, mall flyers, forums all aimed at telling people why municipal ownership is a bad idea. Perhaps it may have been a better use of the money if it had been spent on infrastructure. I don't know. Um, I think it's feasible to proceed, and I'm voting in favor of the motion. Thank you, Ed. Josh? 
Well, first of all, I had no idea Ed was going to make such a nice prepared speech, so I don't have, you know. Um, but you're a lawyer. You <laughs> I'll handle it. Uh, well, and, and I will start with this. Um, just an acknowledgement. Um, I've you know, been around a lot of town volunteers over the years, and Hingham is blessed with having a lot of town volunteers, really competent people willing to put in a lot of time. I have never seen anybody remotely go to the lengths that you, John, and you, Ed, have gone to uh, on behalf of this town. I, I would shudder to think how many hours you've put in. It wouldn't surprise me if it was th in the thousands over this period of time. Uh, don't do the math in your head, because uh, you, you, I'm sure you will regret it. Um, but you guys have done uh, a phenomenal job on behalf of the town. Every time something has come up that has questioned an assumption, uh, in my experience, you guys have listened to it fairly. And, uh, and when it required some rethinking, you rethought. And if it didn't, you didn't. Um, and I, I, I just, I'm, I'm honestly taken aback by uh, how much you guys have put in, into this process on behalf of the town um, in what is, you know, generally a pretty thankless endeavor. Um, and based on that, and then based on the town going out and doing the proper thing, in my view, of uh, checking your work, um, you know, I think the financial question becomes pretty easy. Because I agree, I think the number that they came up with is a very conservative, it took really that the approach is a conservative approach, the numbers they took are, are conservative numbers. We'll never be able to know, right? Because you know, if if you end up buying, if the town ends up buying it, then you've wiped out the future history, as it were, of what the rates would be. Uh, so you're making some assumptions, and that makes the job a little harder. But I'm very comfortable with it, and and I'm and frankly, I'm also compelled by the you know house mortgage analogy, which is at the end of the day, you own it. Uh, and, and you clearly start seeing meaningful savings. None of us will enjoy that, but you know we're fiduciaries for the future citizens of the town as well, or for the young citizens of the town that'll be here 30 years from now. So I think that's that's pretty clear. On governance and engineering, I, I fully acknowledge that there's, you know, that this is no small task. That this is uh, there's a lot of complexity here. Uh, there's a lot of devil in the detail. Um, but I go back to uh, to your. Uh, point Ed about the three what was it 317 yep. towns and and I 337. 337 towns sorry and I you know then I have to ask myself is I'm kind of searching for a reason why we should be different like is, is there some reason why we should be an outlier here and you heard some of that questions tonight you know is, is there something different about our system about our town um, and you know I can't say I'm shocked that that nobody can really identify that um, so, you know, I, I think, I, I mean, we've had enormous success with the light plant. I, I think we're actually a pretty extraordinary town when it comes to management. So I would put us on the upper echelon about being able to do something like this and, and um, getting a lot of people to volunteer to help <laughs> make sure it happens because that's the history of this town. Uh, and I would have no reason to believe that that wouldn't happen um, on a going forward basis. Uh, and the same is true w with the engineering. I mean, it, it just, it seems like uh, there, are, again, uh, the feasibility is there. We just gonna have to do the work, but that's what this town does. It does the work. So, um, having said I didn't have a speech to make, I having just made one, I am in favor of recommending affirmative action on the motion. Okay, thank you. Bob? Okay, thank you. Uh, before I cast my vote, I'd like to uh, first of all say thank you to you and Zig. You guys have done a tremendous job, and it's been a, an enormous uh, learning curve for me personally. And uh, you guys are a real asset to the town. It's been awesome working with you. And uh, again, to reiterate, it's a feasibility study. Is it feasible? Is it not? In my opinion, I think it is, and I'm going to vote for it. Yes, we should. Okay. Joe. Thank you, John. Um, so the downside of going last is all the good points have been made already, but, um, um, you know, I, I would say, uh, again, just add my thanks to the members of the committee, Bob, Josh, and, and Ed, for really drilling down into the segments, the components of the analysis that you were uh, charged with reviewing. I think you all did an excellent job and, and really informed um, not only the committee, but 
you know, the, the citizenry who are going to have to vote on this. I think everyone would benefit from the work that you've done and, and John for chairing us and, um, and being so uh, open and, and graceful about it and uh, to echo jo Josh's comments about just being a, a real source for um, knowledge on these issues that are presented in front of us um, over the years has just been phenomenal in my experience. So, um, you know, in doing this, I've read all of the reports, I've, um, uh, you know, listened uh, during these hearings, um, listened to the report of our expert consultants, which I think um, I give a lot of weight to uh, in reviewing this question. Uh, I think that Aquarian's position has been uh, at times forcefully but you know, well articulated uh, and I think we've benefited from some of the information that Aquarian has brought to these hearings um, and we've taken all of that into account or at least I have. Um, on the finance side, you know, to me that's really the driver of the decision uh, here and I went back and I looked at sort of the financial feasibility criteria that we set out for ourselves at the beginning. Yeah. And I think that those questions that we asked, those criteria that we set up are still the right criteria uh, and we checked the box on, on each one of them that this would be, you know, to use John's phrase, a, a rate transparent acquisition, uh, that the acquisition itself uh, does not increase rates. Uh, we know that uh, not only based upon your fine analysis, Ed, but also upon the uh, pressure testing that was done by the expert consultants. Uh, and I have a, a high degree of confidence that that, that will play out. Um, we'll be able to establish a, a capital reserve and add to that capital reserve. At least that's cooked into uh, the data that was uh, reviewed by Anderson. Uh, and their report wasn't a rubber stamp, obviously. They, they added to uh, the capital that uh, you had shown in your budget uh, or your projections. Uh, and still, um, with that, we have this 50-year, uh, uh, 50 million dollar savings over the 30 years. Uh, and to Josh's point, at the end of the day, the town has the equity ownership, and we get all the benefits of that. Um, again, not uh, don't want to repeat the points, but on the governance and the engineering, uh, there is still work to be done. Uh, I, I would repeat that if the 337. Uh, municipal owned water systems or towns can be served by municipally owned water systems uh, across the Commonwealth and I don't see an impediments in any uh, thing that I've seen uh, to the town of Hingham doing uh, an equally good job. Uh, the structure makes sense. I think that there are still tweaks to be made to it um, and we've had the benefit of some some comments from citizens on that which you know I, I do think there will be an opportunity to transmit that information to the extent it's not already transmitted to the Board of Selectmen so that they can tee up some of these questions such as um, you know, who, who the water and superintendent should report to. Should it be the town administrator or directly to the water commissioners? That type of thing. But that to me is not a decision that we need to wait to answer that question before we move on to giving our recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. So overall, again, I think you know, based upon the financial analysis primarily, but um, based upon all the, uh, the good work that's been done here, I would vote in favor of the motion uh, and make that recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe. Um, I, for my part, I guess, uh, if I go back to when we started almost seven years ago, we committed that we would follow the data. Um, we would do that without any predisposition to outcomes, and I think we've done that. Um, I think where the data has taken me personally is um, the question that I've asked of each of the presenters. We've seen showstoppers, and each representing work of more than one person has said no. I actually think it, uh, based on what I've learned over the past several months, um, when work resumed and governance and engineering uh, after the end of the litigation with the SJC decision. I think there are actually positives, um, some, some benefits to be gained uh, from town ownership. And I won't review again the, the third party reviews about the financials, but with respect to governance, um, I think Josh used the term that I'd gotten admired in the DPU process, and 
without casting aspersions at the DPU, I, I strongly feel that ratepayers will have a much greater say in what is done, both from a capital expenditure as well as uh, just an operational and maintenance uh, perspective in the system and the reporting back of what happens on a regular basis than is the case through the DPU regulator. I will also say that I think I'm sure it will be done at lower cost. This most, as we mentioned the other night, this most recent rate case in aggregate is just shy of $650,000. That's a lot of money that most of it is ratepayer born, but some taxpayer in terms of the intervener status cost. With respect to engineering, as uh, Bob presented, I look at what I think is possible in terms of uh, improving on the history relative to water main replacement, operations and maintenance, and, and I believe that um, if I look at Hingham Light uh, as, a, as a good model, and what I think is possible from a financial perspective to fuel both capital improvement and operations and maintenance, I'm, I'm comfortable that it can be done well and I think with, as I said earlier, from a governance perspective with much more engagement with uh, citizens and, and ratepayers. Um, so no showstoppers, as I've heard, I think considerable advantages and so I also will cast my vote in favor of the motion that the town exercise its statutory rights to purchase the water system serving Hingham Hull and North Cohasset. And by my count, that makes the vote on the motion proposed and seconded unanimous. And we will report out that vote to the Board of Selectmen when they ask us to come before them, but my expectation is that it will probably be at a meeting next week. I just don't know when they will choose to have us come before them. So that concludes uh, the agenda items that we had before us this evening. I would accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We stand adjourned. <laughs>